Well, thank you very much, John, for, for joining me. It's been a it's a real pleasure, and I've been a fan of of, of, of your films in particular. For oh, that's good. Yeah. Um, I'm one of the few survivors, I think, quite honestly. When I look around all the, the wonderful people I work with, there aren't too many of us left, quite honestly. <clears throat> but we forget how long it's how long ago these, these films were, really. Oh yeah. I think about 30 odd years since license to kill, I think. So yeah. What um we want you to get into the business first of all. Yeah, well, I started off uh, at Shepner Studios in 1945, uh -huh. um, which kind of gives my age away, but <laughs> I was a 14 year old uh, and I got a job as a messenger boy. Yeah. Um, uh, I then uh, became an office boy, so I was already on the promotion <laughs> ladder. Uh, and during the, my course of going around the studio, I spent a, a brief time in the master carpenter's office, um, which gave me an opportunity to do a bit of carpentry, which I was always very interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the other places I always found interesting because it, I love the smell of, um, of uh, what is it? Um, acetate. Oh yeah, of amyl acetate we used to use to, to join the film together. Mm -hmm. And it smells of pear drops. And it, yeah. that always attracted me. And uh, I, I, I got to know a few of the boys in the cutting rooms, as some of the junior assistants and what have you. And eventually I was offered a job in the cutting rooms uh, as a numbering boy. We used to number the sound and the picture, which were shot separately. And uh, I would number them so that they could easily identify each scene and uh, synchronize the picture with the sound. And I did this for a little while, for a couple of years. And uh, I worked on a film called The, the Third Man with uh, Carol Reed was the director. Yeah. And uh, uh, that was a very interesting, he was a very nice man, uh, Carol Reed. And, uh, you know, we worked um, endless hours because we had a fire in the cutting rooms and we had nitrate film in those days. And of course, um, they lost about half of the film's cutting copy in this fire. Wow. And uh, it all had to be reprinted hmm. at the labs. And of course, that meant an awful lot of numbering for me to do. Yeah. And uh, so they used to send a Rolls Royce to pick me up from my home. And all the neighbours would look out from behind their curtains and wonder what happened to this boy. They're having a Rolls Royce come and take him to work every day. Um, so I, 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 I earned quite a bit of money, or relatively at that time, um, working overtime and what have you. I'm sure I broke every regulation in the book. Uh, but um, yeah, it was a very enjoyable time. And the film was a great success. And uh, I, I was assigned to work with Anton Karras, the Zither player. Uh, but because Anton Karras was a street musician, he wasn't in the musicians' union, uh, he couldn't work in the studio. So I had to go up to Carol Reed's house in Kings Road, Chelsea, mm -hmm. and actually work with, uh, with, with him there and uh, on a with a movieola. So I run the, the film on the movieola uh, for Anton Karras, and he would... Uh, uh, um, fit his zither music to the to the soundtrack. Hmm. Um, it's quite interesting because many years later, um, I, I was walking past Carl Reed's house there, and I said to my wife, I said I told her the story, and I said when I switched the movie over on, it blew all the fuses in the house. So the butler came along, and together we scrummaged around and found uh, the fuse box. Hmm. and uh, I put a fuse in and it blew again. So I said, have you got a nail? I put a nail in the fuse box and I used to wonder when I walked past the house whether the, the nail was still in the fuse box. <laughs> I doubt if it was. <laughs> um, but that was my early beginnings and um, it then progressed through the assistant, um, assistant, direct, uh, assistant uh, editing stages. Mm -hmm. Until I went to the Air Force, I was a national serviceman for two years. And when I came out, I got a job as a second assistant at Nettlewold Studios, Wharton on Thames, which is a car park now. And uh, 
uh, I, I worked there for a while and uh, eventually um, I actually directed some commercials eventually there. I was editing and, uh, and uh, um, I progressed and um, started to learn my business, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And things all changed. I think when I got a call from Peter Hunt, who was uh, directing his first film on a Majesty's Secret Service. And he called me, uh, I was working on The Italian Job, which was being directed by Peter Collinson at uh, Twickenham Studios. And I got this call uh, in the theater and um, Peter Collinson said, oh, that's all oh, the James Bond films. He said, I know Harry Saltzman, I'll put a good word in for you. I said, please don't, Peter, <laughs> please don't say anything. Um, Peter Hunt came on the phone and he said to me, he said, uh, can you come over to Pinewood? He said, I've got a, a job for you. I thought the first he was talking about an editing job. Um, and I went over to Pinewood and he was directing Diana Rigg and George Lazenby. And he came over and he opened up the, the script and he pointed to the, uh, the, 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 the bobsleigh sequence. Hmm. and yeah. uh, he said read that and tell me what you think and uh, he came back after he finished his shot with Diana Rigg and he said well what do you think and I said well it's a very exciting scene he said well I'd like you to direct it hmm. before I knew where I was I was on a plane flying to uh, Switzerland to a completely different life on a James Bond set you can imagine hmm. um, so that was really my start with the James Bond films that was in 1969 which is an awful long time ago yeah. Um, anyway, I, I, I successfully completed that particular sequence and then I inherited most of the other skiing sequences in the film mm -hmm. and um, uh, finished up editing the film as well. Uh, so it was wonderful. Um, and I did other lots of other films. Um, uh, and then about five or six years later, uh, I was working in Paris for Louis Gilbert. And um, he said to me one day, so Cubby Broccoli is coming over from London. Uh, he's going to have lunch with me. And I, I think he's going to offer me the Bond film to direct. Mm. So I said, oh, that's wonderful. So well, after lunch, he came back. He said, well, Cubby Broccoli remembered you from Her Majesty's Secret Service. And he wants you to direct some of the action scenes. Mm -hmm. So that was my, I became reunited with the Bond family at that point. And uh, really, that for the next 20 years, that's where I stayed. <laughs> and eventually, of course, became director. Hmm. So it was a sort of a, a, a story that you, you couldn't write, really, the way I progressed through yeah. Um, yeah. and uh, enjoyed every moment of it. Well, wonderful. Um, the, the sequences on The Spy Who Loved Me, I think you were involved in the... Uh, the ski jump at the beginning, I think that was one of yours. You've been... Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, the ski parachute jump in uh, Spy Who Loved Me um, was the, the, the job that uh, Lewis Gilbert and Cubby Broccoli uh, asked me to go out to the Arctic Circle and um, do this pre-title shot of the ski parachute jump, um, which was a Union Jack parachute. And uh, it was supposed to be a, a hammer and sickle was supposed to be the last shot in the film and the, the, the Union Jack was supposed to be the first shot in the film. Uh, in the event, they 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 wrote the um, hammer and sickle out, and uh, but the opening sequence um, it was really important to shoot the the last shot of that sequence first, because if we didn't get that, then we would have had a thought of another opening opening sequence, and it was a bit touch and go. Um, Mount Asgard is a 7,600 foot slab of rock on the Arctic Circle. And it was particularly difficult uh, to shoot to get the, the right weather conditions anyway. And I had this young, what we call a young ski bum called Rick Sylvester. He was um, nothing like James Bond. He was about five foot six and uh, wore glasses and a very studious type. And you wouldn't have thought he was a daredevil. But he turned out to have nerves of steel and uh, he did this fantastic jump. Um, 
that in itself really was my passport to, to directing on the Bond films, really, because it was Cubby's favourite action sequence in the whole series. And I didn't realise it at the time, but he'd already earmarked me as a future director of the series. Uh -huh. uh, and that wasn't going to happen until For Your Eyes Only, of course. Yes. But... Um, so, um, so how did the, the offer come to direct For Your Eyes Only? Was Because Lewis Gilbert had done the previous two. Um, well, again, he, because you, that relationship with Lewis, I suppose everyone was kind of saying, John's a logical guy to, to do it. I don't think it was uh, quite like that. <laughs> it was such a huge leap, really. And, um, you know, there's nothing like starting your directing career at the top. Hmm. There's only one way to go after you get your first film as a, a James Bond director, let's face it. Um, but um, what happened was we had a series of meetings. Uh, there had been a five-year uh, lapse between the last film, the last James Bond film, and the and the For Your Eyes Only. Hmm. And now Harry Saltzman had left the series, and now Cubby was the sole producer. Hmm. And he invited me and a, a several other technicians that would work with, with the E.ON Productions uh, for lunch at Pinewood. And uh, we, we had a very nice lunch. And Derek Millins was there, who was our special effects man, lovely guy. And uh, Peter Lamont, the um, art director, uh, who, uh, who fortunately was going to be promoted to be um, production designer on this film and uh, nothing much was said on the, that meeting, it was just a social occasion. And then I got a call to have another lunch with Covey about a week later. And this time I was the only one there with, um, with Covey's wife, Dana, mm -hmm. and uh, Michael Wilson, I think, who's now the producer of the Bond films. Yeah. And um, he then said to me, uh, can you come back to the office? And when I came back to the office here, they were all sitting in the, behind their desks and he turned around me and said, how would you like to direct the next James Bond film? Hmm. Yeah. And uh, my breath was taken away, as you can quite imagine. It, uh, hmm. it was a love bolt out the blue, if you like. Yes. And uh, he said, well, if you need time to think about it, I said, I don't need any time to think about it. And of course, it was a wonderful opportunity. Hmm. Um, and, and how was it like working with, with Roger Moore, say, compared to Timothy Dalton? I, it, it, is Tim, Timothy more serious um, actor in his approach? Well, strangely enough, my first instruction from Cubby Broccoli was to find a new James Bond because Roger had done a series of films and they were thinking he was getting quite expensive and uh, they were thinking about replacing him. Yeah. And... Uh, so I, I traveled the world testing various hopefuls, you know, hmm. uh, for the James Bond role, some very good actors and some very unknown actors. And uh, eventually, uh, fortunately, it was a bit of a poker game between uh, Cubby Broccoli and Roger Moore. And uh, fortunately for me, Roger Moore won because he was a wonderful person to, to work with. And um, I've done a few films with him recently, uh, notably um, Shout at the Devil uh, and Gold in Africa. And yeah. uh, in fact, when, Roger, when I met Roger again, he, he said, are you in my contract or am I in yours? <laughs> <laughs> but he had a wonderful sense of humour, Roger, mm. and uh, was a great professional. So I was very fortunate to have him. Yeah. Uh, he knew everything that the character required. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was he was very nice, very good to me, I must say. Hmm. I mean, out of the, the Roger Moore films, do you have a, a favorite of the of the three? Of the three that I did with Roger? I think the first one, For Your Eyes Only, um, was it very interesting because I was the new boy and I was kind of determined to make my mark on the film. So I was very, I was very keen on action. I, I'd made a bit of a name as an action director and uh, and uh, I, I was very keen to, you know, to make a great success of it. And I had a, a bad start in a way because 
I was using those dune buggies on the beach and uh, they kept uh, the smell of the seawater and they packed up each time. So I had to be very ingenious and had to pan the camera to make it appear that the vehicles were moving. Um, and the whole of the United Artists hierarchy was sitting on the beach under their sun umbrellas. And uh, I was the new boy. And you can imagine going three days behind schedule on the first scene. I was, they were all beginning to sharpen their pencils, you know. Um, but uh, I said to Alan Hume, my cameraman, I said, well, we've got through, through the first week and we haven't got the sack yet. Mm. <laughs> so we, we had a good humour and of course with Roger on the film it was uh, the humour was the, the, the great thing I mean I don't think anyone can ever believe that Roger could kill anyone so you know when we wrote the script we were very keen to get a lot of humour in the film yeah. excuse me yeah. <coughs> okay Right. Um, yeah. Uh, so, you know, I went on and I think probably Octopussy, my second film, I was a little more confident. Um, I was very confident, I would say, on Octopussy. And I love animals. And there were a, we had this circus scene and uh, I, I really took it to the, the full hilt. You know, I had Roger dressed up as a clown. I had him in a gorilla suit and all sorts. And Roger couldn't believe it. He said, you're not serious about this. <laughs> it was quite a departure for James Bond to be dressed up as a gorilla. Yeah. Um, but he, he did it very well. He's a, he was a great actor, I thought. Yeah. Because License to, uh, cause, um, uh, A View to Kill was quite dark in places and sort of almost a precursor to yeah. Bolted. And was that something that you were conscious of at the time? Well, I think we were sort of... Um, you know, when you make a Bond film, you, you try and be current, you know, with the, the moods of the public at that particular time. Mm. And there have been a whole series of very successful American films, uh, which were tended to be dark, you know, like, um, uh, what was that film that, um, that Darby was in? Oh, uh, Die Hard. Oh. Die Hard, uh, yeah, yeah the, the, the Die Hard sort of films were being very successful in America. Mm. And uh, so we were tending to try and harden up the bond a bit. I think maybe um, maybe I'd gone a little bit too far with the humour, I don't know. <laughs> but um, so, you know, if you do a kill, we had Christopher Walken, who was a terrific Oscar winning actor, you know, and, uh, and he was absolutely wonderful. So it was quite a dark subject, really, you know, because, um, you know, the mind that um, the mind gets flooded and um, he, he, uh, he kills the machine guns with his assistant, you know, all the workers. So no one can bear witness to what's happened. Mm. Uh, it was a very interesting script. And we, we, Michael Wilson um, wrote the script and he was um, he, he researched it diligently. and. Uh, uh, all the stuff we did in that film was authentic. You know, we went to the Lawrence Livermore lab in California. Um, we, we researched all that area with, uh, you know, where they made the lasers that, make, that split the atom and stuff like that. So, you know, it was a lot of work went into it. And um, I thought we got a very good film out of it. And then, of course, we used the airship. Hmm. Now, down the road from Pinewood, of course, um, there's a huge hangar which used to be, was built for the R101, uh, the airship of yesteryear. And uh, we went down there and uh, had a look at this huge hangar. And uh, they got airship industries that just resurrected the airships. Um, and uh, we thought it would be use, use an airship in the film. And it was a great idea. And uh, of course, it gave us a great opportunity uh, to have lots of spectacular stuff. The only problem was that um, the, it was, the finale of the film was set on the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Yeah. And uh, there's no way you can stop the traffic on the bridge and what have you. But uh, uh, we found out that um, Fuji Film had got a contract where they would painted Fuji Film all over the airship mm. and they told us that they were doing a, uh, some commercials for them in San Francisco on a certain day. So we made it our business to go out there with a camera crew and uh, we actually filmed uh, the, the Fuji airship 
but we back it was backlit so you couldn't really see the logo on it and we were able to use actual footage of of the airship approaching the bridge with all the traffic underneath and everything else and we even staged a little fight on the on the top of the bridge and later on then we we did replicas in the studio mm-hmm. uh we shot on the plywood back block we had three three bridges three <laughs> golden gate bridges in the end um that's the way you make those films you know it's yeah. it's, it's great fun it's a great challenge and it's a very exciting scene. In fact, a neighbour of mine the other day saw the film on television. He was an airline pilot. Yeah. And he said to me, he said, when I saw that scene, he said, I was shaking in my seat <laughs> because it's so effective. Uh, if you stood on top of the, uh, on the Golden Gate Bridge, right at the top of the towers, mm. and you look down, you see two rows of traffic going by underneath. And then, of course, a, um, a boat goes by beneath that, and you get this terrific feeling of height. A very exciting scene. And uh, we, of course, arranged had, had a fight on the top of the bridge. So uh, it's, it's great fun doing those films, I must say. Well, yeah, and it's a, a wonderful sequence, as, as, as you say. Um, before we get off um, a, a, a View to a Kill, I, I just want to ask what it was like working with Grace Jones. Well, she's a great character. Yeah, I got on well with Grace. I loved her. She was um, very, always came up with something new. She was pretty unpredictable. And she was, she was a showgirl, you know, she liked to, liked to be. The only time I think that um, where we surprised her, completely surprised her, was when we were doing the mind sequence. And I'd asked the special effects guy, John Richardson, to um, to have these trailing cables hit in the water and sparking, like as though it were, they were electrical cables sparking out on the water. But I didn't tell Grace Jones about it. And when, of course, she and Roger are escaping from the mine, suddenly as she's going through the water, all these sparks are coming up, from these cables that are trailing everywhere. And she was genuinely, and when you see the film, she was genuinely scared. She thought she was going to be electrocuted. <sighs> Uh, but she was a great, she was a, a great asset in the film and did a great job for me. Mm. She's yes, still going, she, uh, she's still going around, you know, she's still doing the Henley Festival and all that stuff. It's good. Uh, she was good fun to work with. And yeah. uh, at the end of the film, when we were finished the last shot, I remember I was saying goodbye to her and she gave me a very nice book of, of pictures of her. Uh, and uh, she said, what am I going to do now? Because, you know, she was with us for about six months on that film, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, and you do, you develop a kind of a relationship, you know, uh, when you work with someone for that length of time, they become like part of the family. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, she, she was good. I, I, have to, I have to mention Tanya Roberts, um, which, of course, he was sadly lost. Um, lost. Yeah. Yeah, um, was she good to work with? She was lovely, actually. She was um, she was um, funny girl in a lot of ways. You know, she was she was absolutely she was quite naive in some ways. I can remember right when we did the mind sequence. Uh, Roger came up to me and he couldn't contain himself laughing. He said, "John, you're going to have to go and talk to Tanya. She's refusing to put the mind helmet on." You know, all the people in the mine have to wear a helmet, a hard yeah. hat. Yeah. Oh, she said, I'm not, I can't wear a hard hat for, for, for 10 pages. <laughs> I thought that's hugely funny. So I got, I went into the makeup trailer and she was in tears. And I was saying, you look beautiful in a hard hat. And then I managed to talk around and she was, it was gold really. But uh, yeah, she was a beautiful girl. And uh she had the most incredible blue eyes. And someone has said to me she, that, that maybe she was wearing contact lenses. They were so blue. And we were working on this elevated set and she came up the ladder one day and she looked me in the, uh, in the eye and I looked at her eyes and they were so beautiful. And I said, are they real? And she clutched her breast and said, of course they are. <laughs> So when it came to um, Timothy Dalton, did you have much involvement in his, in his casting or was it? 
Yeah, very much so. Uh, Timothy Dalton uh, had been into the office many years before after he'd done the film called Lion in the Wind, Lion in Winter, mm. uh, where he was. It was introduc his introduction into films, and uh, he was quite amazing in the film. And uh, Cubby had approached him years before, and he not interested at that time. Now his career, he'd matured a lot, and uh, now he was more interested and. Uh, he came to see us at Michael Wilson's house in Hampstead and um, he'd aged a bit and uh, had matured and was very keen on the Ian Fleming stories and uh, was very keen to take them back to a more serious, mm. more of a serious spy thriller, you know? Yeah. And we listened to what he, how his ideas and that, and uh, we signed him, and uh, he he did. We made the we made the films a little bit harder edged, uh, probably not as much humour, but we tried to keep the humour in there as much as we could. But um, not with Roger, you know, it was he was such a funny man, Roger. That you ha you had to use the humour in a more slapstick way, probably. But uh, with Timothy, it was a, a harder edge type of humor. Um, no, he was very good, Timothy. Very good professional act. Do you have a, a favorite scene or favorite moment or memory from uh, The Living Daylights? I think the scene um, probably that we, um, where we did the the chase in the, in the snow where She's got this priceless Stradivarius. It, it uh, Stradivarius. Stradivarius. She's got this, this scene in the snow where she's got this uh, Stradivarius, very valuable um, cello. And uh, uh, James Bond uh, improvises and uses it as a kind of a paddle to steer uh, while he's in the case of the. Of the cello uh, they are sitting on one he's sitting on one side and the and uh, uh, the leading lady is sitting in the other side of the case and uh, it's quite a funny scene actually where you know suddenly there's a bullet hole appears in the Stradivarius which <laughs> could have been a major disaster if it had been a real one yeah. um Covey, when I suggested this um, idea of using the cello case as an escape vehicle yeah. for Bond, uh, we were at MGM Studios writing the script and uh, I went into Covey and I pitched this idea of using this cello case. Yeah. And Covey made a rather rude noise and said, oh, it's a terrible idea. And uh, I, I persevered and uh, he got picked up the phone and he got hold of the music stage at MGM Studios in Hollywood. And um, they, sure enough, they had a, a, an orchestra there and they also had some, you know, some cellos there. So uh, we all walked over to the music stage and uh, Cubby sat in one side of the cello case and I sat in the other and I sold him the idea to use it. <laughs> So fast forward to uh, License to Kill, you were saying that it was influenced by Die Hard, Lethal Weapon, um, I imagine was probably another one. Um, mm. So it was it always attempt to make it much, much darker because it was quite a risk to, to, to take. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting that we used that gas, that gas pipeline, that, well, the gas came from Russia. It's mm. rather topical at the moment. Um, but yeah. uh, they've been pumping gas from Russia for a long time and they had these pipelines running all around Germany. Yeah. And um, we came up with this idea of, I think Michael did came up, Michael Wilson came up with this idea of, of uh, the escape being through the gas pipeline, yeah. where he's yeah. wearing uh, with the villains uh, escapes to the West via the pipeline. Yeah. It's quite a novel idea. Yeah. Um, we always used to try and be first with an idea you know we never we tried not to copy anyone if we copied anyone and it would probably be the keystone cops but um we you know we were met we were often copied but we tried to be original with our action scenes hmm. uh, not not easy really because everything's been done hasn't it oh yeah yeah very much so you um, just do it, put another slant on it you know mm. How closely would you have worked with Richard Maybaum and Michael Wilson on the License to Kill script in terms of 
because it obviously it's, it's a very different sort of tone to yeah well there was um yeah richard maybar started off on license to kill but there was um uh, a union problem uh the writers guild went on strike in america and dick Maybaum was one of the early members of the Writers Guild, and uh, he felt obliged to to leave the production while the strike was on. So Michael was more or less left on his own um, to to write the script. But um, I mean, Dick contributed some ideas certainly in the early stages, but he wasn't able to complete the script. Um, so Michael more or less was on his own, you know. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, the action scenes, you know, I, that was my speciality, I suppose. And the, the truck sequence on License to Kill is quite an amazing sequence. And uh, I can honestly say I was responsible for that. <laughs> I mean, the, the Remy Julian was our stunt coordinator on the driving. He and his French team were fantastic. And I met them first on uh, the Italian job many years before. And I always use Remy and his team on all my films. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he, he, these tankers, I mean, to do wheelies with a 10 wheeled vehicle is, is difficult. And, uh, but it gives you the opportunity to have some great humor. Mm -hmm. And uh, we found a wonderful lo location at Rumoroso in, in Mexico. And uh, it was a dangerous, it was a piece of road that had been so dangerous that they'd bypassed it. Uh, but the old road was still there with a um, precipice on either side of the road. Mm. And, um, you know, we had a few near things. We lost, you know, we started off with 10 tankers, I think, and we finished up with one. <laughs> Most of them finished up down the side of the mountain. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, so would you say that's your favourite sequence from... From the film. I think so. It's probably the most important scene, apart from the, the ski parachute jump on um, Inspire Love Me. I think that was probably my most important scene. Hmm. And um, I want to know because Michael Kamen did the, the score for the film. Was that very much a deliberate connection to Lethal Weapon, Die Hard, bringing him on? Yes. The... Yeah, I think he did the music on Die Hard. I think Barbara found him and uh, liked his score and uh, he was a very nice man he lived in london mm -hmm. um and uh i remember going to talk to him about the score about the music and uh, it was a strangest meeting um he, his kids had just come out of school and he, he was more interested in looking at their homework i think he was than talking about the music <laughs> but he, he did a very good um very good job actually and uh, uh, very much like John Barry, and he used a lot of John Barry's ideas. Mm. Um, he, you know, uh, John Barry was quite unique, really, with um, the way he would open up the screen with his orchestrations. He used to be an orchestrator before he became a composer, mm. and um, he had that facility to make the screen look bigger than what it was. You know, so he was he was wonderful, John, and uh, I think Michael Kamen embrace that same idea hmm. oh yeah definitely um i was thinking some of the actors in, involved um anthony zerb for example is as great as as milton crest do you remember working with uh anthony zerb yeah anthony zerb was good i remember uh when it, we um put him in the uh, decompression chamber hmm. uh, robert darby who was the lead villain uh throws him into this decompression chamber mm. and on the rehearsal uh anthony zerby turned to me and he said uh, where's my where's my stump man and of course i hadn't arranged i didn't realize that robert was going to be quite as physical as he was but uh, anthony zerby was no old hollywood actor he wasn't going to be thrown around by robert darby so we had to get, find a stuntman and dress him up as Anthony Zerb, as, uh, as Zerby. And, and, and that's what we did in the end. We improvised and put a wig on him and, and threw the double into the, into, very roughly into the pressure chamber. Yeah. Uh, the censor didn't like that scene at all because we used a, a rubber face mask and we inflated it when the decompression chamber is activated. 
and uh, it was quite horrific actually i must admit but the sensor objected to it and we had to keep chipping frames out of it um the sensor was pretty hard on that film actually with, with the burning at the end on the tanker particularly he it was a one it was paul weston the stunt man did a fantastic job you know you had breathing apparatus in inside his suit and um we set him a light and uh, you know you can only light someone up for a, for a few seconds otherwise they they, they stop breathing you know yeah. so but paul was very good and it was a great scene and uh, the sensor kept saying no no you've got to take more frames out more frames out yeah. and uh when i see it now i wonder whether they no i don't think they put any frames back but uh quite often now you you see scenes that were censored quite heavily. Mm. Thinking of the time when the film was made, the censor was a bit harder. But now, of course, once it goes on the television, it seems anything goes. Mm. So I think sometimes some of this stuff goes back. <laughs> mm, yes. Yeah. Uh, another great actor in the film, David Tedderson, reprising the yeah. Um, whose idea was it to bring him him back and and yeah, yeah because he he'd been a, he'd been in the films earlier on i think he'd done one other film i think it was uh, one or two no. did he did he do two films i know just 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 the one before yeah one before yeah so um you know dana uh, met him at a party or a house and she said oh he's, he looks pretty good still we maybe we should bring him back so we did uh, the only problem was when we did the parachute th uh, jump where he, he comes into the wedding, he parachutes in with Bond. Um, about the third take I did of him dropping off the off the rig, off the crane, uh, for the last part of his descent on the parachute. Uh, he, of course, he being of a certain age, he uh, he limped for about a week afterwards. He he was he's a good actor though. They keep going, you know. Uh, yeah. But um, no, he, he, I, I probably should have done take one print, yeah. I think, with him. Yeah. Um, it, there's some very nice deleted scenes on the most recent DVD and, and Blu ray uh, of License to Kill. Um, but one, uh, there is um, one scene that I don't know if, if it was shot, but um, the, the actual wedding of Felix and um, what was that actually? Because there was a the Silla Barnes, there. yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, to the barns. There's a still of them inside the the church. Did you actually film uh, that? Oh yeah, we we found a very nice Key West, Florida. We found a very nice church, mm -hmm. and we had to take the um, the telephone wires, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the electric wires that were running. You know, in America, they have the electric wires running on poles in the street, and of course, when our boys were coming in. Um, uh, parachuting in uh, if they touched those wires they'd have fried so we had we had to get the uh, the local authorities to remove the the wires and reroute them for our film but in america nothing is too much trouble you just they just do it you know it's quite incredible i suppose you mentioned it's a bond film and suddenly doors open up for you they do actually which is a wonderful asset to have you know we we have a very fine reputation i mean we're not um, we're not like Michael when he used to bring Piccadilly Circus to a halt or uh, send light to a car or something in the middle of Piccadilly Circus. We wouldn't do anything like that. Yeah. Um, no, we we were very we had a very good reputation. I mean, yeah. we set light to the city hall in San Francisco um, with the with the blessing of the Mayor Feinstein. Yeah, and uh, she said, as long as it's all right with the fire chief, it's fine by me. So you know, we took precautions. We put all kinds of steel plates on the roof and what have you, and then we used gas cylinders and we set the place alight. But uh, it was controllable, and the only thing that got hurt was the uh, was the fire brigade when they put the um, fire uh, hoses out. They they broke the window to the tax office. Wow. which everyone applauded. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, just briefly touching on the, the wedding of Felix and, um, um, and, and Della at the beginning of License to Kill, did you film the actual ceremony of them actually getting married or was that 
was that never never well you do it you do it you do it in parts you know um uh, it, it, you know, you wouldn't, you know, time doesn't allow you to do the whole ceremony, so you just do bits and, uh, yeah, a little just a flavour, yeah, because she, she then gets killed shortly afterwards. It does, yeah. Um, yeah. And hopefully one day they'll put that scene on the, uh, the, the DVD because it's currently suspiciously absent, but whether it's been lost or not, I, I, I don't know. Um, uh, so... Were you surprised in how Licence to Kill was received? Because it didn't do as well as some of the other Bonds, although it was put well, in big films. At the yeah, time. one one of the big problems with Licence to Kill, because it was a, a story that was based on the drug trade, mm. um, which is a very vicious trade, as we all know. And um, because we were dealing with these South American drug dealers um, and what have you, that... Um, you know, we had some very hard scenes in there, you know, with, um, the, the, you know, the shark thing where, where a guy is thrown to the sharks and all that sort of stuff. And uh, it, unfortunately, the censor took exception to the, a lot of these scenes and he uh, gave us a, a, a sort of an adult only certificate. So we couldn't get the children in to see yeah. a Bond film. And normally it's, I think we were, Normally it was 12 plus or something, and, and this time we got an 18 or something. It was yeah. it was silly, really, because now you show this stuff and no one blinks, but um, it didn't do us any favours at the box office, the fact that we had the wrong certificate mm. and they excluded a, a lot of the children from, the, from our audience. Mm. Um, the kids love Bond films. I mean, they just, they just, mm. they just love them. And I, I, I think at the time, fans perhaps didn't embrace it as much as the others. Are, are you very happy now that it's, it's been reappraised and people think it's wonderful? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think now it's a very popular film on television. It's done extremely well. Hmm. Um, Timothy Dalton was very good in it. Um, and, you know, the action in it, um, it was unbelievable. It was so good. We shot the whole thing in Mexico City. Mm. and on location in Mexico. Mm -hmm. It was a great place to make a film. It was a bit hard at times because it's a bit, it was a bit corrupt when we were there, the, the, you know, the missions and so forth. You had to pay your way around. Right. But um, no, it was, it was good experience. Mm. And, and do you think Timothy Dalton enjoyed it more because it was a bit more meaty, it was a bit darker, you know? Yeah, I think Tim, Timothy, you know, he's a real professional and... Uh, yeah, he enjoyed the Bond films. Uh, I think he did a great job. Um, I think, uh, funny enough, he was he was almost a precursor to Daniel Craig. I mean, that style, um, the harder age Bond, it became Daniel Craig's style and uh, acting style. So we were a little ahead of our time, I think, with that film. Yeah. Hmm. Um and then, of course, after License to Kill, there was a six-year gap between License to Kill and, and GoldenEye. At any point, were you going to do an, another Bond, or was it always License to Kill was your, your swan song? No, I think that was my swan song. I think I think I was more or less done. You know, I'd done five, uh, yeah. directed five Bonds, and you need a new broom to come in, you know, with some fresh ideas and reinvigorate the thing, like you change the leading man, you I mean, we, everything was changed, you know, the writers, um, the actor, the director, it was, it, it, and it's, that's what you do with the Bonds, you know, they, I mean, some of the early Bonds, when you think about it, I think Terence Young did four, I think, and Louis Gilbert did probably four, three or four, I can't remember now, but, um, Big Bonds, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, you know, it's unusual to do five, and I was very happy to do five. Uh, they're great films to make. I mean, you know, you shoot for six months, and you create a, a kind of a family. And the Bond family is wonderful to work for. I mean, Barbara and Michael and Cubby are fantastic people. They appreciated everyone who worked on the film. Um, a great sense of humour, very generous appreciate everything that everyone did for them. Hmm. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. 
what your 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 proudest um, moment of your career was or your favorite project well i think without a doubt when i was um, a second unit director and editor i think on spy who loved me i think the pre-title scene mm -hmm. um in you know in mount asgard the actual parachute jump but also the sequence uh, that preceded it, all the skiing stuff, which I shot in Sam Moritz. Hmm. Um, it was a, amazing when you think about the action, now you plan it. Um, and sometimes you'd have four units shooting a sequence, and sometimes you'd be shooting them simultaneously. Hmm. You'd have an underwater sequence shooting in um, in the Caribbean, and you'd be shooting the, the top side of it uh, in Greece. Hmm. and sh sh shooting simultaneously, um, all done with storyboards, all planned. And uh, other times you have aerial sequences and stuff all planned. I mean, on uh, Timothy's first film, I did the, the next fight on the net behind the aeroplane. It's quite an incredible sequence. Hmm. BJ Worth and his boys, you know, sky skydiving guys, hmm. um, the Dublin for Bond and and uh, necros on the net that's a fantastic sequence no mm. uh, we, we have some wonderful action sequences and uh you know you get the you get the time and the money to to make them really well we didn't have cgi in those days which no. funnily enough is an improvement on what's around today i think because you can see you know our stuff was real you can tell that you know it has a different look and different weight to it and uh I mean, yeah. Do you want to do lots more different types of films, or were you quite happy to do that? Well, I would have done. I would love to have done other types of films, but of course, you get you get dubbed as a as an action director, and uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, they're, they're great films, and uh, uh, you know, I would have liked to have done other things, but um, it, you know, I spent so many years working on the Bonds. 20 years I was more or less done I think by the time I finished License to Kill. <laughs> well that must be quite exhausting and um, takes everything out of you as well not easy. Oh, I wouldn't say it's exhausting it's exhilarating really uh, it's like a boy's own adventure when you're making one of those films uh, and uh, of course working for the Broccoli family uh, it's, it's such a pleasure. I mean, there's no, you don't feel any pressure. You know, a lot of films, you feel a lot of pressure all the time. Yeah. Um, they, you know, they were budgeted correctly and scheduled correctly. And, uh, you know, no one tried to, I mean, you shot for six, for six months. Mm. You know, if you can't make a film in six months, there's something wrong, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, John, for, for joining me this evening. It's been wonderful. It's a pleasure for that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Bye bye now. Take care, John. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye. Hi, John. Hello there. Can you hear me? I can indeed. Good. How are you? I'm very good. You? Good. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> good, good. Uh, Okay, so um, so first of all, I just want to say thank you, John, for joining us for this celebration of, of License to Kill. It's very much uh, appreciated. Um, so I just wanted to, to, to ask, ask you first of all, John, um, how does License to Kill sit in terms of your of your Bond films? Because I know Fury is only your favourite, but where does License to Kill sit? Uh, well, it was the most violent one, I suppose, of which I, I was involved in. Hmm. I mean, it's not, it wasn't necessarily my favourite, although it was very successful. I mean, yeah. I loved the characters in it, and, but, you know, it was Tim Dalton's, was it his first one, wasn't it? Yes. Oh, it's, 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 it's um, Living Daylights and then License to Kill. Sorry, no, it's, it's his second one. So he hmm. was better into it than he was on the first one. Yeah. But it, he, 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 was, he wanted to play it violently, hmm. <clears throat> which, which John did. Of course he did, that's what he was told to do. Yeah. Um, so some of it was coming from Timothy Dalton, and I, I think also around about that time you had the Die Hard and Lethal Weapon, so it was very much being, yeah. I think, by the films of the, of the time, I think that's fair to say. Um, and did, did you want, did, was, did the film come out darker than people anticipated, or, and was there perhaps ever a, a, a thing, well, maybe we can edit it down a little bit to get our usual rating or, or how did that sort of 
Well, we, I mean, I'm sure John spoke about this, but there were problems with the censor on it. Yeah. It was very violent in certain sections. <clears throat> and um, we did have trouble with the censors. I think I mentioned that before. Yeah. But, um, you know, everything is surmountable. You can do it. But Cubby was absolutely adamant that he wasn't going to wreck the picture hmm. just to make it a 12. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, because in the UK, well, obviously, it has 15 rating um, still still today. So it does. And of course, the subject matter, I think, also helped to make it but very dark with, you know, the, the drugs and the oh, revenge yeah. as well. Um, I, I believe he did have to do some editing on Anthony Zerb's demise in the... Um, oh, yeah, when his head blew up, yes. Yeah, yes. Well, it was, it, I mean, it, no, it's extremely violent. When we first saw it, it looked a bit comical because mm. it was like a balloon. Yeah. But, I mean, the way it was cut and the, the screaming and this and the other, it, it was, and the sound helped to make it so violent. Mm. And I think we, I think, in fact, I'm almost certain we pulled some of the sound down to mm. get it through the sensor. I can't remember now, it's quite a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. Because from what I understand, I think the, his actual head exploding was, was shot sort of like face on, but yeah. the different angles we used to make it a bit less, uh, a bit less extreme. Um, and I think also we were talking last time about some of the, the violence in terms of, um, the, the death in the uh, of um, Benicio de Toro's character in the oh, um, the drugs in the mincing machine, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I suppose the other bit would be the death of Felix Leiter, not the death of Felix Leiter, but the attempted um, shark the shark attack on 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 Felix. Again, did you have to tighten tighten that up to make it less less I don't think the sound I can't remember I, I mean I'm um, to be absolutely honest, I can't remember the sense of being a problematic with the shark thing because it was you know that was a shark attack I mean it's like yours there's no problem really with that mm. I think it was yeah. excess violence with the feet getting caught or the threat of violence and 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 once again the sound mm. the sound was really violent mm. So they might have had more problem with, say, the, the, the mincing machine, with that might have been more of the, um, <laughs> yeah, sounds like. Yes. Yeah. Um, it would be nothing today of what you see today. It's nothing. No, I think it is it, it's reasonably timid, isn't it, for today's yeah. standard, as, uh, as you say. Um, um, one of the, um, of course, being inspired by things like Die Hard and Me for Weapon, um, the composer Michael Kamen came in, uh, who did both those films. Did you meet Michael at all? Did you have any discussions about music and ed editing and anything like that at all? Well, of course, we ran the film for him with John and and spotting it, and we pre we pre put John Barry's music into it probably, so he had a, a good guide as to where we want music. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> he was the first time I'd worked with him, so. And we had a music editor, we had John's son, was, uh, his elder son was a music editor on that. So that was, it was a very family thing. Mm -hmm. And it was comfortable, it was easy, easy for us to do that way. Like okay. that. I mean, how was Cayman different to say working, say, with, with John Barry? Well, John Barry, because he'd done so many of them, it all became a, it was very uh, comfortable and quite funny. You know, we had a lot of laughs at it. Michael came and was a little more serious about it because, you know, he, he was trying to do, put his interpretation. And when we had, we had, uh, what did we have? We had some, some music songs, which he, which he had at the end. So, and I can't remember, License to Kill. Who, who did that one? I can't remember now. Oh, that is, that is Night did License to Kill. No, that is Night, yes. Um, and we also had um, Patti LaBelle's If You Ask Me To at the end credits, which is yes. a very nice song. Sure. And, and I think Michael came and did a few source music. You know, there was Dirty Love in the bar fight and there was some, some wedding party music as, as well. So there's quite a, a number of songs in there. Oh, yes, a lot, a lot of, a lot of um, <clears throat> atmospheric songs. Like that, mm. yes. Yeah. I mean, I mean did, in terms of your editing of, say, the action sequences, 
was the approach any different because it was being a bit dark, a bit grittier? Uh, well, we had we had more coverage on it because violence is easy to shoot hmm. as long as you have enough cover because you can make it uh, by fast cutting and threatening and and once again sound awful. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it was it, it was. I mean, we were aiming to make it more violent. Hmm. That was the it was scripted violently. Yeah. Um, and when I spoke to, to John Glenn about the film, I asked him about his, his favourite sequence, and he immediately said the, the tanker chase at the, oh, yeah. <laughs> at the end. Uh, would you concur that's the best part? Of the well, it's a fantastic, absolutely wonderful sequence. Marvellous coverage on it, and, and very cleverly shot. Hmm. And because um, I take it... Uh, uh, with, comedy, with comedy in it as well. So it wasn't mm. all deadly serious, you know, one or two things, you know, when the, when the guy jumps out of his truck and goes. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit of humour, which you have to, otherwise it would be, when in, in real life, it's absolutely threatening. Mm. Although I saw something, somebody said something on one of the websites that it could never have happened because they, we, when we cut the, 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 the tube, the uh, air brake tube, whatever it was, mm. that evidently, locks the wheels if oh. you do that. so we don't know that but it doesn't matter i, I suppose it, as long as it makes sense when you're watching yeah. the film and yeah. yeah there's a nice nice sound effect uh, for, for, for that one um did you um because obviously working with people like colin miller and um Vernon messenger on sound yeah. again was the sound approach a little bit just to make it again a bit more well, yeah. Vernon came out to Mexico with us and Colin came on later in England. Hmm. So, um, you know, we, we were doing the sound as we were out there. Hmm. Vernon was creating sound and he had access to the lorries and trucks and, and explosions and things like that, hmm. which yeah. were covered by second unit sound as well. Hmm. I mean, how much of the, of the actual soundtrack can you actually use that's shot on you know actually on the set compared to you know what you have to put in afterwards is it sort of like um a 50 50 split or well I, I i wouldn't actually know i mean because i had a soundtrack to go with the second unit shot sound hmm. and yeah. and so we had a guide to it i mean vernon was just increasing the the, the dynamics of it and the excitement of it hmm. And also because we had to shoot movement. Yeah. And was there any complexities with shooting in in Mexico versus back at back at Pinewood? Well, for me. Uh, well, yes, perhaps from your perspective or anything that you perhaps knew well, about. Well, no, I mean, apart from, you know, worrying about what you're going to eat, you're going to, going to be well because Mexico wasn't the cleanest place to live in. No, no. Then... <laughs> But um, no, it was it was an enjoyable experience. Hmm. So it's quite it's quite a welcoming, quite a nice sort of. Oh, oh yes, oh well, they loved us out there. We didn't see much of Cubby, unfortunately, but because he wasn't very well. No, no, no that's true. Um, we, we we kept him up to date by sending him videos of what we were doing. Hmm. So at this point, was was Michael Wilson and Barbara Bockley taking more of a? Um, a yes, more of a, uh, yes. More, more, more of the control of the picture, and Tony Way and people like that. Yeah. Mm. And how do you find M Michael and and Barbara say compared to to Cubby? Well, they're all the same family. They're all lovely people. Mm. Well, I, I never had any problem with them at all. Mm. You, you can say you got that nice continuity because yeah. it is kept in the. We sort of grew up with them. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly, Barbara. When we knew her as a child. Yeah, yeah. Um, did you ever meet um, Harry Saltzman? I know he was before your Bond time, but I know you, I, I did meet him when I was working on another picture, but not not with him when he was with Cubby. Hmm. Uh, I don't know which one. I think mean, one of Rogers. Yeah. He was to me very brusque and a bit rude compared with Cubby, who was always a gentleman. Yeah. Because I think I think it was very much a partnership of convenience, wasn't it? Fundamentally, that 
Harold Salzman had the, the rights and had the money. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's right. all, all to do with money. Oh, isn't it just? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, last time we spoke, we talked about um, you, you worked on the, the Bond DVDs and you've gone for the archives and you know you 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 found all all there is sort of um, deleted scenes wise, etc. Yeah. Um, and there is some very nice deleted scenes on the License to Kill um, Blu-ray. Um, but there's one thing that is missing is the, I think they did film a bit of Felix and Della's wedding. So after the, the power shoot in, I think there was an additional little scene with them in the church and probably just, yeah. um, do, do you recall that or, or do you know? I'm just trying to think, I mean, I'm, whether we, well, if it was shot, it certainly cut, but I didn't realise if it was deleted or whether it was done because of length of the picture. Or mm. whether, no, I might, is, is it not? I don't know. I haven't seen it. Mm. Yeah. I've got things. I, 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 I would have pulled all the material mm. and when they went into the DVD. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it's but, certainly, not, certainly not amongst the features as it currently, uh, currently Did you ask started. John the same question? I, I did. He didn't really re re recall, I think, just because just obviously it's, it's a, a long time ago, but I don't no, know. I, I'm feeling the same. Um, because there, there is a, a, a picture of, of Dell and Felix in the church, so there is a little still, but that's all that we, you know, us fans really know about it. So, um, um, and I suspect it probably was cut because it was a better introduction to the titles to have um, them land and then, you know, yeah. and then go into it. So it's probably, so it might just be perhaps lost through, through time, or maybe it was just... Um, but it won't be lost, it'll still be somewhere there. It's all on film. Yeah. And everything was kept, and I went through everything. So if, if it was a deleted sequence, it would have gone into the uh, Eon archive somewhere. It's not mm. lost. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, the, so there's probably still a few things that Eon's sitting on, perhaps, for future... Well, have another DVD, or, or the next, whatever it comes out as. Yeah. Um, a... There's very famously, on the uh, on one of the Bond documentaries, when the tanker explodes at the end, Sanchez has died and there's this big fireball, there was a still of like a fiery hand coming out of the, the picture. And I know that John Richardson mentioned this to me, to me a while ago, and he went through all the film trying to find the actual but, film. But was it the actual find... flame, was it? The flame went into a hand. Yeah. Look, well, I, I suppose if you go by frame by frame, you'll find one. It's like... Mm. Any fire, there's lots of movement. Mm. They sort of, this was supposed to be a spooky thing, was it? I don't know. I yeah, I, I think there had been a few um, eerie things that happened on that location because it was an abandoned road and it was, you know, it had lots of history of, a, of accidents and things. So mm. um, I think people were seeing ghosts on, you know, at night and <laughs> trucks were running off by themselves and, you know, just probably something didn't put the brake on properly but I think people were sort of um, getting a bit spooked and of course when they saw that picture they that was kind of a last straw I think for for some of them. So, um, I think that's publicity. Might have a little bit because because I think you weren't really aware of any sort of no. on at the time. No, no not at all. Hmm. Um, I just wonder what maybe some of your favourite sequences from the, the the film might be be John do you have particular favourite moments? Um, well, I, I like the scenes with Kerry Lau because I thought she was very interesting to look at. Mm. Yes, yeah. And I suppose when, you know, she, she challenges Bond with, is as a strong person. They, they were good sequences, the one on where, where he um, tries to take the gun from her. That's a mm. good sequence. Mm. I don't, I don't have any particular favourites. I don't think. Mm. Uh, yeah, and I know Carol. Yeah, Carol Well, I think is probably one of the best best Bond Bond girls. I I think very um, photogenic, along with um, mm -hmm. uh, Talisa Soto. Talisa Soto. Yeah, yeah. She was much more aloof. I mean, uh, Carrie was very friendly with the crew. Mm. Lisa, she was more like a model. Ah, yeah. And 
the, the thing that came from it was the, the young the young lad that came out. He's done very well since. Oh, is, that, is that Benicio de Toro? Oh yeah, Benicio. Yeah. yeah. God, he he he. That was his great opening scene yeah. with him. He's yeah. good. He's got tremendous screen presence. Hmm. Vicious, nasty, and, and then he showed Santis. So, so had um, so had um. What's his name again? Uh, uh, Robert Darby. So Robert Darby, yeah. Mm. I talked about Robert Darby before, I think. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, because um, because I think he was a bit of a practical joker as well, Robert Darby, a little bit. So whether he was quite seemed to be quite jovial on set, from what I hear. Well, John would have known that more than I would because I wouldn't have been on the set necessarily with him. I wouldn't have been. Mm. Um, would you have encountered um, Benicio de Toro at any point? Only when we were, um, we had to do some voice looping or just change things that were that we didn't understand correctly, but mm. not very much. No, mm. he was a youngster, new star. Because mm. I know that Robert Darby was a bit conscious in terms of. Um, I was, well, he was always conscious about what he looked like because mm. I, yeah. I'm sure that's why he was cast. Yeah, had a very distinctive good actor also, but he yeah. didn't like it. Hmm. He's a good actor, anyhow. Oh yeah, yeah, very good. Hmm. Um, uh, I was wondering, did you um, obviously working with Timothy Dalton on on two Bond films? Um, do you remember what what it was like with working with Timothy Dalton, perhaps on Living Daylights, and then, as you say, he was more confident on um, License to Kill. Well, the scripts were better for him in *Licence to Kill* because the um, the one before was really written for Roger, and mm. uh, Tim was not very good at throwaway lines. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there weren't really many sort of tongue-in-cheek throwaway lines in *Licence to Kill*. There were much more vicious lines. Mm. Yeah. Was, yeah, I think much more. Um, Centered around D Dalton as a yeah. as an actor and more tethered to him, certainly. Um, because I take it Dalton was, is it fair to say, more serious in terms of his approach? Yeah. To, to oh, yeah. I mean, he's much more athletic than Roger. Hmm. And, you know, he, he looked good. Hmm. But um, he, he didn't have a particular sense of humor. That's my feeling with him. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what John felt about him. I mean, they had arguments, I believe, about cigarettes and stuff like that. Oh, because yeah. of the sense yeah. and stuff. Yeah. At that time. Mm. Um, but from, from your point of view, Dalton was OK to work with. Yeah. Because would you have had, would you have met him a couple of times? Um, well, of course, we meet him at, at uh, somewhere they came to see films sometimes in the cutting rooms and that, mm. of yeah. course. Yeah, or go or when I went on the set, or when we had the occasional day off. Sometimes we would meet up. Hmm. I mean, I met up more with Carrie Lau because we all went, we all went to the coast one weekend and stayed in a hotel, and had a lot of fun. I'm just trying to remember what happened to that video because I took a whole lot of video with her. Hmm. Whether I could ever find it or play it now. Yeah. <laughs> um. Uh, so, so it was quite nice to work in Mexico, and obviously you had lots of time off. And because was how long were you there at Mexico? Well, the whole, the whole of the time. Yes. Yeah. And no, not, not 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 when they were building, but the whole of the shooting time. Yes. Hmm. And and did you get the sense that from your encounters with Henry Dalton that he was very enthusiastic, very happy with how the film was was, was coming along? Uh, well. I... I would imagine he was happy, otherwise he wouldn't have been very cooperative on the floor. And mm. I think he worked well with John. Yeah. Mm. It was a very tight, everything's tight schedule. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, we didn't talk about The Living Daylights last time. I wondered what, what whether you had a favorite sequence from, from that, maybe the, the, ice, the ice car chase or something like that. <laughs> Um, well, they tried to do that again, haven't they? Well, that was that was that was interesting. It was not, not necessarily my favourite one. Um, I, don't, I don't have any particular favourites. Hmm. 
they were all everything every sequence you put it together because it's all put together at different times mm. and, and you, you're excited and you know once i've assembled it and put it together i'd call my assistant in or assistants mm. we'd all look at it together and have i missed something i've got it wrong mm. and then wait and then i'd show it to john and he'd say what else you got <laughs> that's his favorite saying mm. Um, yeah, I think for Living Daylights, I think is a is a really strong Bond film, and I think it really just you know f flows very well, and great cast, great locations, good scripts. So I think it's um, you know one of one of my favourites certainly. Um, I, I just wanted to do you remember working for Alec Mills at all? Yeah, God, Alec, I've known him for many years. Hmm. He was camera operator for many years. Yeah, I can't remember how many pictures I've worked with him, but he took over as director of photography. Hmm. And he's excellent. And with Mike Frith and his various crew around, it was Mike Frith on it. I'm not sure. No, I mean he was he's a good cameraman, good, and very flexible, hmm. and adaptable. Yeah, and knew John very well. They got on well together. Hmm. Because by his point, of course, it was a very tight crew that most of them had gone through numerous films together. So hmm. I imagine you all kind of had a bit hmm. of a shorthand, and it was all. You know, quite easy to sort of do to work together. I think Arthur Worcester, I saw more of Arthur than, than Alec. Mm. <clears throat> Although in the same hotel, we'd meet up in the evening for drinks and chats, and he'd see yeah. the rushes, of course. And because mm. Arthur essentially was was mainly on on the second unit, wasn't he? Sort of doing. Yeah. Um, oh, he was. He was terrific. Arthur was terrific. Hmm. Afraid you wouldn't be able to get him to talk anymore. He's gone now. No, he's very sadly quite recently, wasn't it as well? Yeah. So, um, would you have anything to do with with the continuity side of things? So, say June Randall. As, Good as God, yes, of course. I rely yeah. on her. Hmm. I mean, we were on film then. So we didn't have digital remarks or digital digital quotes. It all came in on paper, hmm. and and June was fantastic continuity. And also, when you're looking through notes later on, when you want to go through stuff, she knew which takes were complete, which ones, uh, you know, were better for one thing, or if the sun went out or they changed the lenses and things. All that information is on a continuity sheet. I don't think we get it now. Hmm. That, that was the way we made them. And she was very important to us. And we had a second unit one as well. Hmm. Otherwise, and which, which all, all those notes are really important to an editor hmm. and also John can then talk to her and say you know I don't like that or don't use that and that information would go onto the sheets. Hmm. Yeah, yeah very key key role isn't it? Uh, uh, there was um, quite a, a good underwater sequence in, in Licence to Kill. I was just wondering from an editor's point of view how you approach underwater sequences, how do you keep the pace moving that sort of thing. Uh, they're, uh, they're a bit like Moonraker, space stuff, underwater slow. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, um, I think we had enough coverage to make it quicker than it was, probably. Hmm. Well, what, what was that? Was that going to find the... the uh, uh, what was it? The, I'm trying to think what the sequence was now. Yes. When it uh, went down amongst the pillars and the all the... Oh, that, that's, um, I mean, that's for you eyes only, I think, that one. Oh, no. sure, that's another picture. Um, <laughs> but with Licence to Kill, um, Bond has uh, got on board the wave crest and has, has planted the, uh, the, the um, no, he's, not, no, he's, he's gone on the wave crest and he's investigating, essentially trying to work out what's, how, how Milton Crest is, is involved mm -hmm. in the, uh, in the plot. And Sharky is the, the, Frank, who we were talking about earlier, uh, is is killed by the villain, and Bond harpoons the the guy who killed him, and then jumps in the water to escape. And there's this big underwater sequence of him trying to find Bond, and eventually he harpoons the plane. He surfs behind the plane, yes. throws the pilots out. It's a great uh, great sequence. But, um, no, I mean that, that was a good sequence, but I mean that that wasn't so slow because it didn't go on for very long. Mm, yeah. So something like, um, say, Few Eyes Only was a bit more of a challenge because you had a lot more sort of underwater. Um, yeah. Um, I was wondering about the the, the, the bar fight sequence. I thought it was rather 
Well, that like. was the first one when, when I first got out there. I think that was one of the earlier sequences in shot. Hmm. Yeah. And then, again, I think very good use of that song as well. Dirty well once Love. again, we have enough cover. You can, you know, cut around things that are, you know, hmm. if you're a thump and a face doesn't look right, you use another take. Hmm. <clears throat> um, Trying to make it look real, that's the thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and sound you... helps. Yeah, yeah. And if, if you've got music, you're cutting it to music, rhythm. Hmm. Because I know when I was talking to Norman Wanstall fairly recently about Dr. No and his his films and um, being, you know, obviously his role being the dubbing editor, he was very much saying that back in the 60s, it, the uh, Bond sound was very exaggerated. It was larger than life. It, yeah. It's not something you'd hear in a Marks and Spencer's elevator or something, you know, it, to, <laughs> to, to quote Norman. Um, but I suppose by the time your, your bonds, particularly the Dalton ones, the sounds were becoming much more sort of real. They were they were they were more real because you could create them properly, yeah. more so than I think Norman could in those. So we had more facilities or more availability, hmm. and also more frequencies you could use. You could make them much sharper. Hmm. A bit more sophisticated resources, yeah. Um, yeah. Also, uh, they were loud too. Yes. <laughs> Gunshots were much louder than they are normally. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's because um, I, I think I remember Steven Spielberg saying about Ways of the Lost Ark, um, Indiana Jones's handgun was a shotgun or something, you know, natural, <laughs> you know, bigger than, than, than life. Um, the only other actor I wanted to, to mention, uh, um, John, do you, do you remember Anthony Zerb at all? Oh, well, I can remember him there because my wife came out there and went out to his home. I didn't go hmm. with his wife, and but he died too. He's all. Oh, is, is he still not? Is he not with us anymore? I thought he died too, didn't he? Uh, I, well, I, I, he did actually cameo in one of my events last year. Um, we did. Um, he, uh, he he had a role in the in the Mouth Uncle. Um, maybe maybe he of, didn't. Maybe maybe I, I I've killed him off. It's, I think he's still, I mean, to be honest, these days, you never know who's going to be around you wake up, do you? That's, um, yeah. that's the feeling I get he's sometimes. He's Milton Crest, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. I, think no, he, still... I didn't have any specific dealings with him, apart, hmm. from, apart from when we happened to meet them as a crew of meeting, you know, when you meet people. Hmm, yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to say he's still, he's still live and ticking. Um, oh, good. Sorry. He's got, he's got, got a birthday coming up on May 20th as well. Oh. So, um, <laughs> but I think it's and I think he's still very active in terms of um, you know still doing films and, and things like that so um, which is quite nice. Um, I just want to see if anything else I wanted to to ask. Um, oh we, last time when we talked but we, we sort of mentioned a, a couple of names we didn't really sort of go into anything about them. Um, you mentioned uh, working with Robert Wise. I just wanted to perhaps know what, what kind of man Robert Wise was. Well, Bob, Bob, I knew him as Bob Wise. Um, he, was, he was a film editor beforehand, before he died. I've only worked with him once, which was on, on The Haunting with, with Alan Soames. Hmm. And I was the sound assistant with Alan, and we created all these offstage sounds of the haunted house and things like that. And in those days, it was... It was a black and white film to give it atmosphere <clears throat> and it wasn't it was mono it wasn't stereo hmm. so to get he he i mean what about bob bob Ryan? lovely man absolutely and he he spent a lot of time in the theater with us when we were, were recording sound effects hmm. because he um he was interested and he would sit in front of the theater down the boat with his script and the light, and he'd be writing and listening at the same time. <clears throat> so if he created a particular sound, you know, like we built big ladders all built up on top of each other and to drag the radiator on the top and then knock them all over and recorded the sound. Hmm. And he let, played it back and things like that hmm. for him. He, he was, I mean, I didn't realize how important he was as a director because I was a young man then. Hmm. He was very complimentary to everything we did. 
and I think he's well. You say a very prolific and important director. Um, mm. A lot of people will probably know him from his role in Star Trek: The Motion Picture. He directed that one, and if that hadn't been a success, you wouldn't have all the the Star Trek empire that you have now. So, um, just one example here of his um, importance. Um, and I wondered if you, if you had a favourite memory of, of David Lean. Well, I spent such a long time with him. I spent sort of like nine months with him in his company on Chivago, once mm -hmm. again as a sound assistant. <clears throat> well, cutting rooms and sound because we were all involved together. Mm. And Norman Savage was the editor. And I spent, we used to eat with him every night. I had my wife out there and Norman had his wife out there. And we never saw them. <laughs> we were all working. David was workaholic. So we'd start at, you know, 8.30 or 9 in the morning and go on till 9 at night. We'd eat yeah. together. That, that was well in post-production, but during the shooting out in Madrid, I would only see David when rushes, when we ran rushes. Yeah. I didn't go out, well, I went on a few of the sets, but didn't go out to the big sets, no. Mm. But I admired him. Mm. Got a fantastic director. Yeah. One, and, and would listen to what you said. He would run sequences with Norman. They called Wynne Ryder and myself in there and say, what do you think of this? Mm. And, and we'd give our comments. And David always said, he said, if you don't like it, tell me, but I want to know why. Yeah. If you just say, well, I just don't like it, he wouldn't accept that. Mm. So if you said, well, I thought that was a bit short or I'd like to see a bit more of that, he would take, he'd listen to you in that respect. Hmm. And what was Win Ryder like to, to work with? <laughs> Mad. No, he's all right. Hmm. He was, um, oh God, well, I did several pictures with him. I hmm. was a glutton for punishment because I didn't, I didn't mind him. A lot of people couldn't stand him. In fact, well, the Americans couldn't stand him. Yeah. And John Chivago, they called him my assistant. <laughs> <laughs> And, and and so was working with say someone like Stanley Kubrick a bit more a bit well, more that, difficult. That was only there was only one picture and mm. that was on on, on two thousand and one. Yeah, but I, I just did the breathing. Mm. <clears throat> That's all I did, and I've told that story so many times. You yeah, 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 told. Yeah, did yeah. I tell it to you? I think you did. Yeah, the sounds of the breathing in in, in space yeah. is, is and your. And the number of times we had to do it, I was mean, mm. about six months that took me to do. Mm. Oh dear. <laughs> take it away and do it again but try again yeah. he was desperately waiting like a lot of things mm. uh, he would go and go and go until he, he got what he wanted but he couldn't always uh, explain what he wanted mm. yeah I, th I think that was something certainly with the breathing mm. because he wanted me to do it in the real helmet yeah it was so difficult and and also nobody knows what it sounds like in space, so <laughs> we're all desperate. It was just just breathing and exercising mm. and trying to move without making the thing crackle and pop. Yeah, I had I was we shot on thirty five sound mm. at MGM. Mm. I had two thirty five tracks running at the same time, so that I could then cut between them and mm. get the the white noise or the filler. So it had the same, so it didn't click and bang as you cut it. Hmm. That was done from technicality point of view. But it was interesting. But uh, once again, um, you know, you, you'd go in there, you'd spend, you'd spend two days shooting stuff. You'd take a week editing it hmm. and, and go and see Stanley. And then he's all get an appointment with David Wilde to go and see Stanley. <clears throat> And go and see him and say, well, I've got a sequence to show you. Would you like to see it now? A range of theatre. And he'd come in and he'd sit down at the front of the theatre with a notebook, with, a, mm -hmm. with a, 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 a recording device, which was quite new then. A yeah. little thing he'd spoken to and he'd just talking all the way through it. Hmm. <laughs> and then he'd come up and say, well, very good, do it again. So, <laughs> um, there was one person that I wanted to mention, uh, Alan Hume. Yes. Remember, do you remember Alan at, at all? Very well, yeah. Good, good friend he was. He lived near us. Hmm. And his family as well. He, I mean, well, he, was, he did Spy, didn't he? Spy loved me. 
Uh, yes, kind of me, yeah. Um, a view to the He did know. a lot of carry on films. He did yes. a lot of, lot of, that's where he learned his trade. Hmm. Yeah. He was a good, good fun man, nice man to be around, very talented. Well, hmm. on Spy Who Loved Me, he, he did the parachute jump. He's the only one that got it, only one that photographed it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was a marvellous. Um, well, that's John, to John Glenn's fame. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. he chose him. Yeah. Um, I, we did mention Wild Geese last time, but we didn't mention uh, um, Ewan Lloyd, the uh, producer. I don't remember if, um, him at all. Well, I mean, he was he was a publicist, really. Hmm. Uh, and um, a good producer. He got the money hmm. and got the directors and made films. Hmm. Um, I did. He he gave me my a, a break after I cut the first Bond film I did uh, for your eyes only. Yeah. Um, he gave me Who Dares Wins because, and you know I needed that because I needed to get away from John. Right. Well, I needed to you know not get away from him, but to have another, you know that it was my cutting, my editing as against John's. Hmm. Because to it's like if you work for Bob Wise, you 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 edited what he wanted. If you work for David Lean, you work what he wanted because they're all editors. Hmm. So so you were able to spread your wings a bit and yeah, your own person sort of with. Sure. You know. No, um, he was very good to me. I'm very pleased. Hmm. I liked him. Yeah. Um, I did um, wanted to mention uh, you, you composer John Williams because I believe you said you. You met him a couple of a couple of times. John Williams worked with him on Goodbye, Mr. Chips. Yeah, yeah. That was that was all over a year. Hmm. I worked with him because we had to do all the recordings, all the songs, and that with Leslie Brickers. I've I've done a, a guy writing a story about John Williams in the States. Who I did a long Zoom call with him, hmm. talking about it. <clears throat> all right. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose with, with, with along with John Bowie, I suppose John Williams would be, you know, the, the, the one of the best composers. Yeah, wonderful uh, recorder, but yeah. a, but a bit of a nitpicker. I, I, I last time I, I did mention you've got that Moonraker badge behind you. Yeah, is that an original one or is that a? From the no, original? that somebody sent me that. Ah. I, I don't think it's from it, it's it's from the film. Yeah, it's very nice that. I yeah. think they, they it wouldn't it wouldn't have come off the set. No. I, I no, suppose I, you, done, well, I don't know. Somebody, somebody sent me that. Yeah, I, I suppose people didn't really have the presence of mind to sort of keep things from from these films. I suppose most most went in the skip. And I wish I wish I'd had a camera. I wish yeah. like self is today. Oh yeah, yeah. All these people we work with, all the people we talk to, and this mm. we have no recognition working yeah. with Liz Taylor and things like that. All these famous people. Yeah. All the people. <laughs> Have now gone. Omar Sharif is another one. I mean, I think David McCullum. Somebody asked him in an interview, "What did he regret not doing?" And he regretted not having an autograph book. You yeah. Know, it, especially yeah. in a big TV series, where you had lots of huge faces coming in every week, and especially as they become so collectible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, how, what, how do you feel, John, about the, the the sort of commercialism of 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 it all in terms of? Well, I think I think it's very good. It gives people they suddenly think if I've got a script that's worth ten thousand mm. pounds and I sell it on eBay, well, basically it doesn't belong to you. Yeah, yeah. I yes. mean, I don't I don't know what would happen. I know when Bond stuff used to come up, mm. Michael had a team of people that used to approach the people and say you can't sell that. But when no. it happens now, there's so much Bond memorabilia comes up and Star Wars stuff. Mm. Comes up on for sale now. Yeah, because um, I think one of the nicest things is is those those events at, at Pyramid Studios, and there was a a big one for License to Kill a, a few years ago, and I think we we met each other first at um, one of one of one those of the, one of the done by Gareth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I, do, do you have any favorite memories of of the, those kind of events? And oh yeah, uh, to, to, yeah. Meet, to meet up with people and. Mm. Well, it, basically, he was very good by getting us so-called celebrities. I mean, it's just because these people, the 
the uh, enthusiasts or anoraks or whatever you want to call them come mm. from all over the world. Yeah. Again, they said, seriously, came from all over the world, mm. you know, just to come to one of these things, to run the film and to have a meal and to chat to some of the people. The more mm. they, they wanted to talk to the artists and, mm. and the ones that, that Garros could get. Mm. Um, I mean, when I used to buy Stephen, John went to many of them. Hmm. So his book, the job God John Richardson does. Peter yeah. Lamont did. Hmm. And and are you surprised at the attention that that someone like you gets because of obviously being behind the scenes? Did you ever think that people would, you know, like myself, want no, to talk we're, to? We're, you? we're backroom boys, basically. We're we yeah. storytellers, creators, big hmm. jigsaw puzzle sort of writers. Yeah, <laughs> and but I think it's very nice that. You know, um, oh yes, it's, it's now. But the trouble is now. Now I'm eighty, nearly eighty-four. People come up and they know more about the films I've worked on than I know myself because I can't remember. And a lot of the Bonds had very similar stories. Mm -hmm. you know, it's always the baddie and the goodie and and this and the others and ex beautiful exotic locations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and fun pictures. Mm -hmm. But Labyrinth, when, when one of the last Bond films I went to, Bond um, openings or one mm. of these things, somebody came up to me with a Labyrinth poster. Mm. It was his favourite picture. And because my name is on the front, he wanted me to sign it. Yeah. Because I never got credits on the Bond, not on the, not on the paid advertising. Mm. They do now, but in my time, they didn't. Yeah, very different, isn't it, in terms of yeah, recognition and... Like well, that. I mean, you've only got to look at the end credits on a film now, as long as the picture is sometimes. <laughs> That's one thing I did think when I saw Dr. No from Rush of Love recently in the cinema. I was like, oh, I can go home now. And it was about 30 seconds of, of credits. And it was remarkably different to, um, you know, I think it's like eight minutes for No Time to Die, the credits sequence. So it's. Um... Well, I remember with Gerlin and Globus on, on, on their pictures, they yeah. insisted that they have every single person. So there were even the tea girls, the drivers, the sweeper uppers, everybody's name on the end. Mm. And he said the reason for that, they'll all buy a video because oh, yes. the name's on it. <laughs> yeah. And they made more money from the video than they did from from um, from the film. They did a very clever thing. They brought out the extended versions of the Lord of the Rings films, where they allowed fans from all over the world to pay forty dollars or whatever it was, and you could have your name on the credits of the you know as, as a thank you sort of thing and of course they probably funded the 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 whole project based upon you know you know these um you know, it's quite an interesting idea um, well i think that's in special thanks too that's often and and all the sort of product placement that's all sorry finance films now hmm. i mean when you edit a film and you've got product placement are you thinking about well you'd have to look at the contract we yeah. had a problem with Concord, mm. one, one of them, because they we had to use a shot and it was too long. So right. someone said, you know, and, and I think Cubby talked to the spot or talked to British Airways or, or British, whoever it was, VOA, no, British Airways, yeah. And they got around it because you couldn't have the whole of that shot in. Too uh, right, yeah. I mean, it's embarrassing sometimes when <laughs> you know, it looks like product placement. Mm. You know, the guy gets a drink and puts it around and holds the label up. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think there is, I think, yeah, I think Moon Rake is probably the one we're talking about with, with the Concord and yeah. there's, there's obvious... You had that sign and that, that was all right. Mm. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering what you thought of the, um, apart from your your Bond films, do you have a favourite... Bond, Bond film, or you know, well, it's, I, I think I told you before, I always think Spy Who Loved Me was the best one, yeah, with Lewis Gilbert because mm. that was the first introduction to the Bond, and it was so exciting in so many locations, which I hadn't, although I'd been on big pictures, mm. I hadn't been on ones which had so many sort of short locations but huge crews going out. Mm. I, I think it's the film that had, had it all, isn't it? I think it's yeah. very jumping on for. Ooh. for new, new fans. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we've also mentioned working in Mexico, but when you're working in France or, on Moonrake, was that... Was that in a, Paris. Yeah. We did Moonrake yeah. in Paris. Oh, that was lovely. Super mm -hmm. time there. Mm -hmm. 
we, we took a gamble. John and I lived in an apartment together, mm. which had, you know, and we used to take our wives out every other weekend or, or, or whatever. And if, 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 because Lewis refused to work on a Saturday, hmm. well, the French don't work Saturdays anyhow. So we always had Saturday and Sunday off. Either we'd come home, or we could do, or we'd go skiing. <laughs> that sounds, sounds very nice. That was good fun. Hmm. Um, I, I know, though, uh, is there any reason to believe, do you think, John, that any deleted scenes from Moonraker or footage is, is, in, the, is, in, is in Paris rather than, than Pinewood because of that joint production? You mean, is the film there? No, yes. all the film came back to England. It's all yeah. come back to it. All came back to the vault. I went mm -hmm. through Moonraker. We had a huge amount of film. Yeah, because all the all the space stuff was all high speed run up and stuff. Mm -hmm. That I mean, I've been through all. I didn't go through all the plate stuff because it was just mm -hmm. it had been. It was it was really uh, well, the process of Technicolor, I think, and they put all these cans out in the field once when they changed. And they all mm. went rusty. Well, I had real serious trouble opening them, mm. and and it, I mean, all the good stuff was in the vaults at Pinewood. Mm. Well, that's all been cleared now. It's all gone. But uh, there isn't any more material. Because mm. I know people were, were thinking about the the music sessions in particular for Moonraker. I think some John Barry, I think, did the score in mm. France and. Uh, like a lot of the soundtracks, they've been lost, and I think people were thinking. Well, now, I mean, it would have been my responsibility to get everything back in England. So, including, including the music, it's, it's it's all back. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. So, yeah, I, I think certain things are, are lost. I think after a while, aren't they? So, um, um, I mean, what did you think of the, the set designs on Moonraker? Did you get to go and, and see all the Ken Adams um, wonderful? Well, Ken Adams, they were fantastic. Yeah, absolutely hmm. wonderful. Yeah, and the centrifuge was such a complicated set. Mm. Wonderful set. Yeah, I mean they were in. But we had what two or three studios there, so we'd take over the whole French film industry. <laughs> yeah, I, I heard that the French crews were so inspired that they were doing overtime and things to finish it off, and because they, they wouldn't necessarily do that normally. So I think it was, I think, a nice project for them for them to have as well. Um, I wanted to mention briefly uh, the Sea Wolves, John. If you remember very much about the Sea Wolves, Sea Wolves that was shot in uh, where was it India, wasn't it? Yes. Hmm. Sea Wolves. I didn't go out on location on that. John, John did for yeah. a while. He did the second unit. No, it was a good fun picture. Nice little picture. Hmm. Good story. Now you and Lloyd again. Hmm. Yeah. And you you never um. Uh, you, we have never offered the sequel to um, Wild Geese, Wild Geese 2. I take it that never came. No, uh, Alan Strawn did that, I think. Hmm. I, I wouldn't have been able to do it anyhow. Oh, yeah, I think we've been tied up on the... Um, tied up on something else, yeah. On Bond, probably, at that point. Um, I've got a little note just to mention Ralph Nelson. Did that name ring a bell? Yes. Yeah. Ralph Nelson did Soldier Blue. I did Soldier Blue and will be conspiracy with him. Hmm. I was a, I was assistant on both of those. Yes. Uh, Soldier Blue was shot in Mexico. Uh, Alex Beaton was the editor, mm. and they came over here to edit it and to do the sound, and and that was uh, um, a very controversial picture. It was a love story. I don't know if you've seen it. It was a love story, but it mm. had an extremely violent section in it. Yeah. Well, the Indians were massacred <clears throat> by the Americans, mm. and it, uh, it 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 hit a sore point, I think, with Americans because of my line massacres, and so very controversial. Mm. Yeah, my wife didn't talk to me for six weeks after that picture. Really? Because <laughs> she hated it. No. Still doesn't talk about it. No. But yeah, it was a love story. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, but there's certain things that just don't gel with certain people, isn't it? Really? Well, so, so she doesn't like violence of any sort, really. So extreme mm. violence like that was, like cutting women's breasts off and slashing pregnant women. It really was. I mean, it was all done, you know, with prosthetics and on mm. film. It wasn't done digitally, that you know, film. No, no. And they, you know, if they wanted to chop someone's legs off or run them over with a truck or something, they'd have a paraplegia that had no legs, put false legs on them, and then and chop them off. Hmm. 
it, violence is extremely easy to do. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, do, do you normally, John, prefer violence to be in the imagination or do you, you know, is, is it? Is, well, I, I, I don't like extreme violence. Of course, I've cut a lot of it. Of course. Mm. But, um, and that can be, violence can be much worse if it's off stage. Mm. Yes. With sound effects. Mm. You don't have to show somebody having their fingers cut off. You can do it with them. Yeah, you can just have the sound and the reaction and things yeah, like that. Scream. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, the only other director I wanted to mention, uh, John, was, uh, was Blake Edwards. Oh, God, Blake Edwards. Hmm. Julie Andrews' husband. Well, that was um, Tamarind Seed, I think. Yeah. Tamarind. yeah. God, you, you know more about what I've done than I know myself. Oh, I, I try. Yeah. <laughs> Tamarindsey was shot in, what was it shot? It shot in some exotic island. I was working with Ernie Walter. Hmm. And he cut it over here, up in London. And working with Blake, Blake had great trust in the cameraman and, and the actors. And he wouldn't, he, when he was directing, I saw him directing in England when we did part of uh, the, the stuff here. Hmm. He, um, he, he says action and turns away and listens to the dialogue. He's very much a dialogue-led man. Well, that's my feeling. Was. Hmm. Omar hmm. Sharif was in that picture too. It's good. Hmm. I, I must have. Um, Julie, Julie Andrews loved, loved the cutting. And she'd come in and she'd say, can I make a cup of tea? And I'd say, oh, I'm his assistant. And his assistant said, no, no, I'll make you a cup of tea. Said, no, no, let me make a cup of tea. I'm never allowed to make the tea. So <laughs> Julie can make the tea for us. Mm. Lovely. Mm. Uh, and just to, as we start to, to finish off, John, I was wondering um, because, of course, you you witnessed an awful a lot of change in the in the film industry. W if you were thinking of going to the business now, so if you could do it all over again, would would you would you want to? Would you find it more difficult? Is it were you sort of in more of a golden well, age? No, because I've been that much younger. Yeah, you'd be digitally inclined. No, I mean it's fantastic. Now I don't think they cut any better. I think yeah. they overcut, mm. and because they can shoot digitally, they have even more film. There's not enough thought goes into stuff now. Mm. I mean, I mean when John was shooting, you know, he wasn't shooting digitally; he had film. So you know, you've got ten minute run. Not mm. like today, you can run for two hours or something on a chip, mm. on a big chip, and and just keep going. Stop, pick up, pick up, pick up. Hmm. And and uh, I might be great for documentaries, but for a, a, a written drama, I hmm. don't think it's good. I think it becomes an editors I talk to now. <clears throat> Many of them, you know, because we have discussions. Of course, I'm still involved. Hmm. They it's cut too fast. Yeah. <laughs> you get you, you've got to go with your initial hmm. feelings, not cut or take another take another two frames off that, which you can do very easily now. Hmm. I used to mark my film up and then put it together and and then run it and hmm. then trim it if necessary. But every time you trimmed it, you had to physically unpeel it. Yeah. Although I can cut digitally now, I've learned to put it down, but hmm. I, would I could still go back to film, no problem at all. Hmm. Uh, and when was that sort of transition that came in when you switched from- The end, end of the- yeah. 90s, yeah. Hmm. Was it just sort of very sort of? Well, it almost, it almost happened. I mean, I did, I did a picture in Croatia, that was on film. Hmm. And then um, the producer there said, "Why didn't we shoot this digitally?" Hmm. Um, but then they hadn't got the cameras to do it, and all the, te the technology grew very quickly. Hmm. I mean, we had we had it. We had it film, and then you went on to instead of going going from a movie over and synchronized, you go to a Steenbeck hmm. or Chem. So that was sort of in between period. So when then when when Avid first came in or Lightworks first came in, yeah. they would have the controls like a film control, like a, a Steenbeck and that. Yeah, it's completely different now. Hmm. You, you don't lose something from losing that tactile nature. It's not like say. Reading a book versus reading a book on a on a tablet or well, imagine it's exactly the same. same. Very similar to that. It's a good 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 analogy. Yeah. And, and do you think the industry is as, as good as it as it was in terms of your perception of what's happening at the moment? Well, a massive amount of 
product. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 you know, of course, of course, it's still, it's still, it's still a fantastic industry to be in. Hmm. If, uh, I mean, there's such a shortage of technicians in this country now. A shortage of editors, shortage of shooting space, shortage of cameramen, shortage of everybody. Well, we, we are training everybody. We're training them, but it's hmm. just this Netflix and all this streaming stuff. Hmm. There's so much product that's got to be filled now. It's a question of the having The BBC having three channels or what are four channels now, and all this stuff's got to be made, it's all got to be edited, it's all got to be produced, hmm. it's got to be paid for somewhere. Hmm. I mean, would you still say that the, the, the best technicians, the best, you know, um, studio space is, is still England? It's still you know, the full run of everything. I think it's in England because it's a tax system helps it. I'm sure that's part of it. Hmm. I mean, we have wonderful studios. I mean, Leavesden now and is huge. Hmm. And, 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 you know, we lost MGM when I was in it. That was a wonderful studio then. Yeah. We've still got a bit down at L Street. Your BBC have built a new one there. Mm -hmm. it's, it's still a thriving industry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I'm retired though. <laughs> yes, it, it seems like the, 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 the pace of working, say the the, the demand well, for the them. hours are still the same. The hours yeah. are still the same. It's, yeah. it's still although you know it's a little more diverse now, there's far more women in in the cutting rooms than there used to be, hmm. which is a yeah. good thing. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, when I spoke to, to, to John Glenn, he's he, he going into license to kill. He very much felt that it was going to be his last his last film. When you went into Vice to Kill, did you have the same feeling that this was kind of where your Bond journey was was ending? Or was no, that... not at all. No, no. No, I mean, I thought I was going to do the next one because I'd worked with the director. And it was a long period of time <clears throat> because of the I, and my, uh, on um, what, the, what came after that. Uh, well, gold, gold, no. Gold, no. Yeah. So no, I mean, I really thought I I thought I was going to do that. But he, he, even though I knew the director, he didn't want anybody on the film. He wanted to try and do something completely different because the Bonds up to then had been very family oriented. People mm. went from Bond to Bond to Bond. The only people I think they had on that Peter Lamont because he had a written contract and he'd done all the work anyhow. Yeah. You know, there certainly seemed to be a sort of either conscious or unconscious mm. a clean sweep of, of a lot of the technicians and with, with Goldeneye, whether it was Martin Campbell being people that he perhaps just just knew and felt, well, I, I have a relationship with this yeah. editor, this director of photography sort of thing. Because um, I get the sense that some directors on Bond, they, they bring their own people in, especially oh, yeah. more modern sort of films. Um, oh, yeah. Well, Jim Bond's now American. <clears throat> American editors, I believe, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting to see how Amazon own, owning Bond now, sort of, well, far, far. Amazon, do they own MGM for them? Uh, yeah, yeah, they bought MGM and the deal just very recently went through. So they've got 50% of it with, uh, with Barbara and Michael. Oh, so. I'm sure Barbara and Michael haven't let that go. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, they've got all the controlling, you know, they, they got all the, um, the final says and uh, stuff like that. So I think... I don't think it's going to change as much as people think it will, but um, it's quite an interesting <laughs> element to it. Um, I think that's probably everything I needed to, to, to want to go through with you, John, unless you had any sort of closing remarks on, on your thoughts of, of Licence to Kill, whether you think it holds up as, uh, as, as a picture after all these years. Oh, I think it still stands up. It's still a Bond film. It's a good Bond film. Like all of them, they'll they all go on forever. Mm. People will always want to see a picture that's well photographed, mm. well edited, and and glorious locations. Yeah, and not full of digital effects. Mm. Yeah. Because unfortunately, I mean, although digital effects are very clever now, some of these films, it's there isn't any real action. It's all green screen. I would think. So I think it's all the imagination. Mm. I think that's part of the, the appeal of, of the Bond films that even now they do as much in camera as possible. And that's real. That's yeah, they're real trucks. They're not, they really explode. Yeah. 
yeah <laughs> turn over in it yeah i mean um is it easier to to edit when something's actually real compared to you know well i would think because you knew you've got the final product as against today with people or oh, you know i've done stuff where you've got green screen and it's going to yeah. be put in but i mean it's just you it's all there when you're playing with it you're not sort of imagining it I mean, on the bonds, I used to photograph or have photographed for me just the sort of shot of the scene as it was going to be, as it was storyboarded. So yes. you could cut to that and hold that, you know, it's an insert or or a, something or just so you could run it as a story. Hmm. Because against green screen, you could see somebody going this, that, and you don't know what they're doing because there's nothing behind them. Hmm. Um, just a, a final thought on License to Kill. Were you quite surprised that it didn't wasn't that successful when it when it first came out, or was it kind of? It, how did you feel about its reception at the time? I thought they, probably they thought it was a little bit too violent, hmm. and we had a lot of competition too. But I'm sure it's made money in the end because they. Oh but yeah, I think all, all of them have um, been very successful and. Uh, it's one of those main Moonraker. They thought Moonraker was the most expensive one, and yeah. they thought that was going to be a disaster, yeah, because it was so slow. But in fact, I think it was one of the most successful ones for some reason or other. I think it came at a good time, but you know, it, yeah. it took advantage very cleverly of the Star Wars phenomena. And, um, and it, I think Moonraker is one of my guilty favorites if you know what i mean so i think i think i i do i do like a bit of mean maker but um well i mean when i was on 2001 i couldn't believe how boring it was right. you know, two hours of slow and waltz music and blue danube and it's a very clever but that still st many people that's a sort of when they go to film school now they have to they use that as a a, a story you know, mm. for what filmmaking is about, or oh, Kubrick generally. Yeah. And David yeah. Lee. Oh, there, are, there are certain ways, films, how can I explain it, <clears throat> of my lifetime of films? Uh, they've got to be entertaining. They've mm. got to, you've got to believe it's happening at that time. It, it mustn't be too violence this is for my own thing not too violent hmm. and 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 if it can make you laugh or make you cry you've done your job hmm. and there's one other person wanted to mention do you remember working with Roger Daltrey at all yeah on buddy song yeah yes yes was that he took too? over from the director unfortunately the director was a really gentle giant I can't remember his name now hmm. and somebody and we had we had uh, Chesney Hawks who was a young star, a young up-and-coming singer who was really good. It had a pop, a number one hit song, hmm. but, it, but it was all to do with, Roger took it over, but it was to do with, it didn't become very successful because they didn't push it. it, it who was it? There was a fight going on between the producers. I don't know the politics of it, but hmm. I mean, that was a good little story. Yeah. Good yeah. story. Hmm. Quite well made. I mm -hmm. like Roger. I saw him not very long ago. Oh. He, he's, he's, he's aged very well. He looks terrific. That's wonderful. Aged, yeah. And um, I think we mentioned um, Dr. Shivago. That was quite a... a, a well, that's, that's my favourite picture. Well, it has to be. Your favourite, yeah. Because it took 15 months of my life. I was just married. And, hmm. and it was, I don't know, it just, it was so wonderful. Hmm. I was or inspiring i don't know hmm. <laughs> i really can't explain what it was it was just you didn't mind working every hour for this guy you didn't mind we well, used to cycle to work and got a car well nothing hmm. so i got i earned 49 pounds a week hmm. and got 49 dollars expenses oh wow <laughs> <laughs> that was in 1964. it's still quite quite good for the time though. yeah yeah. Um, uh, just thinking back about your, your Bond experiences in, in general, John, is there um, it, a, a favourite lo location you, you've worked with on a Bond film, a favourite? Oh, I think Corfu was the most Corfu. fun. Yeah. 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 
Mm -hmm. Because the cutting, it went, I mean, when we go on the Bond film, we, well, when we went then, we had to take everything. You took all your, your movie owners, sort of steam backs, everything. It all got shipped out there. Huge, hmm. huge shipping. Hmm. And, and do you have well, a... We didn't uh, do that in Mexico. No, Mexico, we had everything from Los Angeles there. Because yeah. there was a... And... and as we said, License to Kill wasn't that well received at the time, but of course now it has enjoyed a, a, a resurgence. Is it is it gratifying from your point of view that it's had this reevaluation? Oh, I'm, glad, I'm glad for Barbara and I'm glad for the people who put the money out because you've got to make films for money. Don't don't knock it. You can't make films for fun. No, that's not, if, you, if you get fun making, that's great. But you make films to make money. It's a commercial business. Hmm. Uh, and what do you think makes License to Kill such as a uh, success and why do you think people are, are, are drawn to that one in particular? Because it was violent. No, I think they like violence. People like violence. They watch a lot of it. Hmm. Well, you've watched, yeah, you've watched Game of Thrones and we've become more used to violence, haven't we, I think, yeah. as, a, as an audience. And, um, well, it was violence well done. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's good. That's a good description of, of License to Kill, isn't it? In, in a little tagline, violence well done, yes, <laughs> in some respects. But, uh, um, Entertaining yeah. violence. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a really, really good a good film. Did, we, did you ever go to the premieres, John? Was, yes, uh, all of them. Were, were, were they yeah, nice? They were all do? very privileged people, we were. Hmm. To meet yeah. Princess Diana and people like that. Very, very privileged. Hmm. Not, not as much as John did as a yeah. director. Of course, he goes and he's very front with it. Hmm. We, well, we were people there and you got introduced and you shook a hand and that was it. And you had yeah. a lovely party afterwards. Hmm. Parties were the thing. Yeah. And, and, and finally, John, is there, what is the best thing about being involved with the world of, of James Bond? Cubby Broccoli. Cubby Broccoli, yeah. Yeah. Or well, the Broccoli family, actually, they were lovely. Hmm. I can tell a small story. We used to, I don't know whether I've told you this, um, when we were on the Bonds, because well, we were on film then, you have to use uh, what they call leader or spacing, we called it, to build hmm. up soundtracks, because you, you don't have it all magnetic, it's all made up with old bits of film. Yeah. And, and you used to buy that. <clears throat> and we used to get seven and sixpence meal allowances on those films, I think. Well, we say, and at the end of all the films that I've done, I've always taken my crew away. We've always gone away for a trip somewhere. Hmm. And on one of, one of the, I can't remember which bond it was, for your eyes only, or, or living neighbours. Which one was it? I can't remember anyhow. But we paid a thousand pounds deposit on a coach to take you know, all our, my crew and their wives, and we were all going to, um, all, we, all going to France for a weekend, for a weekend jolly. And the coach driver ran away with the money, and we didn't have a coach. Right. But we um, we we all drove down to Dover to, to no Southampton. Where are we going? We were going to France. Where did we go to? I can't remember. We were going to Dover. So where would you gone from? Do Dover or Southampton or wherever. It is. Anyhow, and the, the, the ferry people let us on because they said that he cancelled that morning and he knew that we'd been stitched up and it, it, it all went in the hands of the police in the end. But anyhow, Cubby found out later on that we'd lost all this money and paid it back to us. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was something very touching. Hmm. Yeah. Anyhow, a uh, great, very, very happy memories of the Bond films and everybody. I'm a very privileged person to be on them. Oh, yeah, I think everyone who I speak to involved with Bond says the same thing. It was a lovely experience, family orientated, and probably the best experiences they've had, you know, in the business, really. So, yeah. No, I've been very lucky. Had a lovely time. Well, I think that's a lovely point to end on, John. So um, <laughs> it's nice that. talking to you again, anyhow. And and you. Alrighty. Well, see you soon. Yeah.
take care and hopefully we'll uh, run each other at some event or something in yep, the future. You never know. Absolutely. It's a very small world. Oh, it is, yes. Okay. Yeah. Look after yourself. Stay safe. Stay safe. Stay safe. Take care, John. Bye bye. So, um, yeah, thanks, Anthony, for um, joining me uh, to talk about License to Kill. It's uh, one of the, uh, I think, one of the, one of the best entries in the in the series. Yeah. Um, and, and much like when we talked about Quantum Solace last time, uh, there was a writer's strike, I believe, in license, with License to Kill. So that, I think... Yeah, them. we had, um, we had a, a little bit of a problem uh with that initially of course michael wilson was writing but he mm. um he was able to do some writing but uh, mm. it was a tricky time mm. very tricky time mm. um, uh, um and i think originally the, the idea was to perhaps set the film in in china i mean still have it about a drug baron but originally i think the idea was to perhaps set it in china but i think there was lots of issues and complications and set i don't uh, remember that mm, yeah no. I, yes i, I th there may have been talk of that but i would think mm. in those days to make a film in china would be quite difficult i think it's one of the things they looked at and very quickly went oh no no we can't can't do that at this point so um mm. um and, and i believe that the, cho the choice of basing the film in mexico was to some extent a financial one well, the the uh, the pound versus the dollar, the mm. dollar got very very strong. I think it got up to about one eighty four or something like that, which was made it very expensive mm. uh, to work in the UK. Mm. Um, so we moved to uh, Churubusco in Mexico. Mm. And I think that the, the budgets for bonds hadn't hugely increased necessarily with, with inflation. So I think that might have been a another factor for going to, 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 to Mexico. Yeah, I mean, they're just the, the pure, uh, just the basics of the, of the budget. You know, you budget the film at maybe 150 uh, to the dollar as opposed to 184, and there's an enormous difference. Hmm. And um, that, um, whether it was cheaper in the end, who knows, but... Uh, um, it was an experience. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so how did you guys find setting up in, in Mexico initially in negotiations? And, and was it a smooth transition? No, it was very difficult. Mm. The, um, we had a lot of problems with the studios. When we, I, I went out there in mid-March. Right. And I don't think it was a, a month probably before I got an office and before we got a fax machine set up. Hmm. Remember, in those days, there was no internet, no mobile phones, no, no nothing like that. So you relied very much on a fax machine. Hmm. And um, I think it was it was a couple of weeks into April before we got a fax machine set up. Hmm. The, the bureaucracy was enormous right. and the bribery was was tremendous as well. Hmm. And um, it was not a pleasant experience out there right um when it came to the, the the bribery i think john grover said that um if you left a bottle if you gave them a bottle of whiskey at customs they would let you go through and you know it was, it, 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 oh it was terrible was ter yeah yeah um, terrible um the um everyone was on the make hmm. and um yes it was very difficult I mean, did you guys feel safe over there? Was it security uh, a big issue? Um, I don't think we had. Um, I don't remember. I know a few of the few of the girls had their handbags slashed. Mm. Um, I, my own daughter, who came out, um, she had her uh, handbag slashed with a razor blade on a bus. They were very clever. Right. But, they, we caught him, or they caught him, and uh, marched him off to the police station. But mm. nothing much happened. Not much you can do there. Right. There was quite quite a lot of um, minor robbery, I guess, uh, against tourists. They were very clever how they operated with a mm. razor blade. They could cut open a, a woman's handbag and um, 
get the hand inside. Yeah. Yeah. And um, but actually, when it came to actually using the production facilities that Mexico had to offer, it was comparable to, you know, say Pinewood or, or... Mm, not really. I mean, we made it work. Mm. I mean, we had to uh, clean up the stages. We had to repair the roofs because they leaked. Um, we, you know, just the stages was where we um, we built the sets. But it was it was quite it was hard work pushing it through. And um, some of the locations were good. It 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 worked quite well in the end. Yeah, it looks. I think the film looked glossy enough. Oh yeah, yes, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, did you have a, a favourite location uh, in, from the film? On on the, the film? Oh, on the yes, yeah. Well, not really. Uh, Key West was fun. Yes, it looks at yes. With the three weeks we spent over there. Um, mm. uh, we, we, I mean, even that we had a lot of problems. Um, with with that and and um, because of weather, we had very very bad weather in Key West. Tremendous mm. rainstorms and and squalls when we were out at sea. <coughs> um, we very often had a uh, couple of times. I know the crew were out at sea, and uh, we were waiting for them at one o'clock in the morning to get back because they either got stuck on a sandbank or something. Mm. And uh, I remember once we bought, went out and bought like 75 pizzas and God knows what to give them something to eat when they got back. Right. Yeah. It um, was coming back, you know, traveling back at night through those waters. They're very treacherous waters sometimes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think one of the, 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 the very impressive sequence is, of course, where Bond uh, is lowered down on the um, the helicopter attaches the cord to the Sanchez. Oh yeah, but, but things like that must have been quite, you know, logistically awkward. Um, it took a lot of planning, hmm. and, and obviously quite a lot of guts as well. Those guys hmm. who did that, yeah, um, to do all that, um, and you did it for real. You know, hmm. nowadays it would be um, all done in visual effects and CGI. So, but that was all done for real. Hmm. And um, the, uh, I, I know when we did the parachute jump in Key West, I mean, that was quite complicated because we had to get all the power turned off for quite hmm. a way around the church. And we had to contact every house to say, you won't have any power for three hours. <laughs> Right. four hours or whatever it was and mm. we did it yeah um, um, and uh, when I spoke to John Glenn and John Grover they didn't have any recollections of the scene I just thought I thought I'd ask you Anthony um after Bond and Felix parachutes into the the church um it cuts to the title sequence um but there was apparently uh the scene of the match of Dello and Felix getting married apparently it was shot or there was a montage version or or something that was filmed inside the church. Do you recall that at all? I don't remember that. No. Mm. Yeah. Um, no, I don't. No, I. All I remember is the two guys go walking into the church, trailing the um, the uh, parachutes like it was a veil. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. There was a there was a publicity shot of Felix and Dello in the church, but. Um, no one else. I don't, and, and, and I don't remember yeah. going in, but uh, yeah. I had so much work going on behind the scenes. I didn't hang around mm. the shooting much. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I think some people might wish to know, Anthony. But your title for, for, for this film was was obviously production supervisor. What sort of things were you involved with on a day to day basis? Well, basically the same. It, it just organizing the shooting and making sure every, had all the facilities hmm. to um, all, all synced up to, to work. It's uh, hmm. you transport, the catering, the locations and, hmm. and all that sort of thing. Um, I didn't, you know, didn't, I didn't have to worry about the extras or anything like that. That's down to the assistant directors, but hmm. uh, just kept an eye on the budget and, you know, and that sort of thing. And, and made sure everybody 
it, everything was ready for the unit to go in and shoot. That's yeah. Yeah. basically the same, which you do as a production manager or um, line producer, or, uh, although not so much nowadays because there's so many people on a film crew nowadays, I don't know what they mm. do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it seems to me that many of them nowadays haven't got a clue what they do. Uh, no, that's right. Um, yeah. What's License to Kill a, a, an easy budget to keep hold of because you're in somewhere new, you've got bribery issues, all kinds of things. Was it something that um, keep in yeah, check? It's the, same. it's the same as always when you, I mean, obviously, you budget it beforehand, you know what the crews cost. Um, you, you know what your schedule is, you know how many days, uh, you know how many crew you have, um, local and British, um, they're budgeted. Um, the things that throw you, obviously, is bad weather or sickness um, or falling behind schedule. Yeah. They're, they're the things that add, add to the budget. Uh, generally, the general costs are normally controllable because you know you've got going to shoot for 71 days and you've got 120 crew and they earn X amount and to put 120 days times X amount in the budget. Mm, um, yeah. So that's a basic. Mm. And you know what the camera rental is for X for number of weeks and you know what the sound rental is. So all those figures, it's only um, if weather hits you or sickness hits you or... Uh, director falls behind schedule mm, yeah and you have to go another day or two but then you know what a day costs uh, all those sort of uh, there aren't too many hidden factors i mean obviously bribery comes into it but you have an allowance in the budget for that yeah um You know, if you do go over schedule and you've got a, a, an ex, a crowd of extras on, I mean, that obviously adds to the extras budget. It's mm. it's all fair. It's pretty well controllable. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you, it's only if you have a terrible, terrible, uh, one of your main actors goes sick for a week or two, then you're seriously in trouble. Mm. If you can't swing other sets in. Yeah. Um, and that happens. I mean, that happens, or they might even injure themselves, uh, uh, especially on an action film. If, you know, they might be off for three or four days, and you have to find alternative work if you can. Because hmm. I, I know Timothy Dalton was always very keen to do as much of his stunts as possible. So there must always have been a slight trying to rein him in a little bit here and there. Yeah, you have to allow him to do a bit, maybe. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think one of the most impressive sequences in the whole film is the tanker chase at, at the end and the obviously modifying the, the Kenworth trucks must have been quite an ordeal. And I think the lo location, I think, was quite treacherous. Um, yeah, it was. Mexicali was quite a tricky location. Yeah. Mm. And, and um, adapting those trucks to do was quite a big job as well. Mm. Um, yeah. uh, trying to do doing a wheelie with a truck that size and uh, mm -hmm. it was quite hairy work um uh, but the second unit did that yeah there mm. and mm. Uh, oh, sorry did you want to say something happening no 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 um I, I wanted to, to to ask you um what you thought of the actual script when you first read it because it is quite a, it's much darker tone than pre what, what was that evident from 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 the onset that this was going to be a harder edge to it well, I, I, that doesn't that sort of doesn't concern me. I mean, all, when I read a script, mm. I, I mean, I first of all read a script as the story, and yeah. then I go through slowly, and then I go through again and break it down, and then I schedule it. Mm. Um, I don't consider whether it's a dark or fun or whatever. That doesn't concern me. All I'm concerned about is getting. Uh, a schedule out to know how many days and then I can sit with the director and he to go through it and say oh he might say I need another half a day on this set or no, I can do that one in a day less or something like that and you adjust but then the change the schedule changes 10 times before you get the finals one 
Mm. <laughs> so. um, was there certain locations or shots or things that just couldn't be done because of the complexities or the, the you know the budget? Um, I can't. No, I can't remember uh, us cutting anything out because we couldn't um, we couldn't afford it. We couldn't shoot it. I, I think sequences very often did get cut from the script because you, mm. the budget or schedule had to be reduced. You mm. cut something out of it. Yeah, mm. um, I think I, I think the bond, if if an idea is rejected, it sometimes works its way into an, a, a later film. Sometimes, I, I... oh yeah. Uh, we've had uh, sequences in in Bond films which have come up in four or five different scripts, hmm. and uh, I, um, I can't remember one offhand now. But uh, and and also as the film progresses, um, um, people get ideas, and the script, you know you get script amendments come out. Scripts cha it changes as hmm. the stunt guy might get an idea or the. Uh, special effects might get an idea or the art department or even myself. When you mm. see the locations and see how it's going, you, you suddenly think, well, it, it'd be better if we use that location. Mm. Um, can, can you things recall, change. Can, can you recall a, an instant where you had such an input and it and you're particularly proud of it or you see it and think, oh, that's, you know, that's my idea or things of that um, nature? I can't offhand. I've had a lot of my ideas accepted. Hmm. Um, I've had a lot of the ideas poo pooed. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, um, yeah, I mean, I have suggestions. I've made suggestions, which are hmm. if we sit in the meeting, you know, around the table with the producers, the director, and special effects and stunts and what have you, and you, you throw ideas around the table, you know, come up and then someone enlarges on it, then someone says, oh, yes, but what if, and you build on ideas. Mm. And um, yeah. we all have a little bit of, little piece of that maybe, mm. to, um, it's a sort of very often group thing. Yeah, I, I suppose most films are like that, they're very collaborative, and I, but I suppose Bond's a, has a reputation of being very family-like and everybody. Well, it, it's, an action film um, where we would sit round. I don't know whether they do it on other films. Yeah. Uh, um, I know I would very often call a meeting uh, with everybody just to pin down what we were going to do. Mm. Um, and I, I can't, I think, with the Mexicali shoot with the tanker sequence, I mean, there was a, a lot of changes because of maneuvering those trucks mm. down that Trixie Road. And, um, and to get them back again for another take was a major, <laughs> you know, because I mean, you know, uh, very difficult roads. That yeah. they, they did extremely well, those guys. Mm. Uh, um. I, did, did you think that Timothy Dalton was much more comfortable in the role by this this time? Did he seem to be um, more relaxed? But yeah, I, I think I, I, I think on Living Daylights he he was comfortable. I, I seem to remember. Mm. I, yeah. Um, you know, he was a capable actor. I mean, with a lot of stage experience, I think he was. He was um, um, not the most energetic of Bonds, but it, it didn't have to be. If, um, well, I think he was comfortable. Hmm. Yeah, um, because it, he, he was going to go on and do a, a, another one, but as we touched on before, legal issues set in. And mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, how, was there any development at all after License to Kill on the next film, or was it just cut kind of dead pretty much afterwards? Um, no, I don't think we, no, I don't think so. I think, mm. I can't remember when the, when it all came to a halt, but uh, and obviously uh, there was the premiere at the end of, um, uh, when was the premiere? Uh, 89, wasn't it? 
Yeah, July 89, I think. Yeah. Um, I can't remember if the legal problem had already taken place uh, then. I, I can't remember when that when that came in, hmm. but we, we wouldn't have expected to make a bond anyway for another two years, so 89, 91. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, now I can't... Uh, I can't remember when that when it came in. Um, yeah, I think it might be more sort of ninety-ish, ninety. Yes, yeah, so I think it was. Yeah. Sort, yeah. Sort of thing. I think they might have had like there was rumours it would be property of a lady and other. Yeah. Things. I don't yeah. think it, nothing was sort of finalised because, of course, when Bond did come back, there were major changes. Partly because of people passed away, like uh, Maurice Binder and Richard Maybaum. so it must have felt quite weird coming back with Goldeneye after the break, but also because you had different people, not the, different people, others weren't there. And... Yes, the, the, sort of the family was changing. It, hmm. Yeah, I yeah. mean, which was maybe not a bad idea. You know, you get a new blood come in. Yeah. Um, and Goldeneye was a pretty good movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think it was better than License to Kill. Hmm. Um, and the, that's another story in itself, but I mean, yeah. I think that um, hmm. um, I can't remember on on license to kill. I think I can. I can't remember the script changing too much. Hmm. Um, yeah. uh, it, it, we always sort of, I think, had Key West in mind, hmm. and um, and the tanker chase. I don't remember it changing too much. Uh, mm. Obviously, there were more local scenes and and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. uh, no, I think I think it sort of stayed much mm. to the original script. Mm. Did, did you ever get any sense how Richard Maybaum and Michael Wilson would collaborate together on on a script? Is it no? I, I, not not my concern. I mean, they yeah. just. I was just a nag, for God's sake, where's the script? I need to know what to do. <laughs> so, so there were revisions and things fully, you know. Oh, all the time. time. I mean, the, um, the, the script pages, <clears throat> the pink pages or the blue pages uh, or the yellow pages, mm. whichever. Um, uh, the, the order is pink then blue and then whatever. I yeah. mean, I think the, the script always finishes up multicolored anyway. Mm, with dialogue yeah. changes or uh, idea changes that come in. <laughs> Would you have someone like Richard Maybaum on set or at least in contact so you could sort of, as you say, react to something um, like or change? Or... He wouldn't be on set, but he would be contactable, yeah. Mm. yeah. Was he, um, do you remember him much as a person, Richard Maybaum? Yeah, well, I'd say. I was wondering if you remembered Richard Maybaum much, uh, what kind of person he was, that's that sort of thing. No, I never really had much to do with him. Mm. I had no need to. Mm. Um, I mean, my, my problem was to get to get the script and schedule it. And yeah. so we knew what we were doing. Mm. Um, so I would nag, nag for the script. Where's the script? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they'd have to sort that out. The producers would have to sort that with the director. Yeah. I think to, I think Tomorrow Never Dies had a, lots of revisions and very much like what what you were saying, script changing all the time. And I I, I heard a rumor that there wasn't probably a, a, an original page by the time it was it was it was probably finished. no. Um, no, I, I mean I've got the script, but I haven't looked at it yeah. uh, for years. I don't know. Probably yeah, but that's quite common. Yeah, um, because you can get a pink page because you change a couple of lines of dialogue. Hmm. Yeah. Um, quite what happens nowadays because with all these uh, the films have got so what I hear have got so massive now with the crew they have because it's got to be all this woke society and God knows what um, but and you get an awful lot of uh, executives on the film now it seems yeah. and no one seems to know what they're doing so mm -hmm. I, I hate to think what it's like. I know it. I know it's pretty awful making a movie now. Hmm. 
well, if you look at something like No Time to Die, which I think was 250 million plus and huge crews, the credits are a lot longer than they were, say, on License oh. to Kill. Um, yeah. but it sounds like a lot of it is complex through um, not necessity, just for, for the sake of it. It, seem, it seems a bit like that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's, it started to get like that on... Um... Not casino, was it casino? I don't, I don't think it was casino. I think it was a, a, a couple of movies later on. I think it started it's sky, growing. Maybe Skyfall sort of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, do you recall seeing the um, License to Kill for the first time, a, a rough assembly, or what did you think of the film at the, at the oh, time? Um, well, normally I would see the Bond film in various stages, probably. 20 or 30 times before the, pre the premiere. Mm. Um, but License to Kill, because we finished shooting in Mexico and uh, I stayed out there for, I think, another week to wrap it all up, or two weeks, I can't remember. Um, I then went off, what did I do after that? I went down to the Galapagos Islands for a bit, then up to um, we spent Christmas in um, ABC Islands, so I didn't get home till probably mid-January. And uh, I probably went in and saw into the editing and saw the film down again. Mm. Um, yeah. I think, I can't remember what I did after that. What was my next film after? Um, well, I, hang on, I'll have a look at my CV and see what I did. Mm -hmm. After uh, um, what was the film I did? Die another day. Well, I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, what did I do? Um, I don't think I did much after that. The next film I did after that, I've got the here on my list is Goldeneye, but I mm. think I did a couple of small films which I don't have there. Uh, I've got uh, Fall from Grace, 94. Um, well, yeah, yeah, but Goldeneye was before that. Uh, well, uh, well, just according to IMDb, um, it's got Fall from Grace, 94, Goldeneye would be 95, so it must have been very... Oh, uh, yeah, I beg your pardon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because I did another film called Goldeneye in 1989. Oh, was with, that? With, yeah, with Charles that. Grant and Phyllis Logan, yeah. And yeah. then I did Where's, Where No Angels with Neil Jordan and Robert De Niro. Mm -hmm. Then I went out to Israel to do Not Without My Daughter. Then I did The, the Innocent. I can't remember what that was now. Then I did Wild Justice. Then Fall from Grace. Mm -hmm. Then Goldeneye. The Bond Goldeneye, 94. Yes, you're right. Mm. Now, yeah. yeah, I did a few in there. Mm. <laughs> And, and and had you got used to the idea of maybe not coming back to Bond, or was it always in your mind you would return with? Um... Well, I mean, one was always in contact with the producers, and you get a lot of update now and again, and mm. um, and then we probably got a pretty early war. I think I seem to remember I got a call from Michael Wilson mm. uh, to say that. Uh, it had been settled or it looks as though we were going to win or that sort of thing mm. and stand by to get going. Mm. Um, mm. So, um, yeah, I mean, but there was always another, another bond on the horizon. Mm. Um, I think there was a bit of a misconception with License to Kill because it was a harder film and it had an awful lot of competition from the box office from, Things like, like um, uh, I think, as a Lethal Weapon sequel, among, uh, Indiana Jones, I think, the second one, uh, Last Crusade had come out. So because there was a gap, people thought because it didn't make as much money as some of the others that it was a failure. Probably, yeah. And that yeah. must have been a bit, bit tough for a lot of people, probably, that might, might have been involved with, with it. Um, so it's quite gratifying that now it's become this the, 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 this classic, ahead of its time film. Well, it's going to be difficult, isn't it, now with um with this lockdown period we've had and 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 it it's going to be a while before they get another bond going and now we've lost daniel yeah so there's going to have to be a whole new concept 
Mm. Um, so it's going to be probably four or five years before between bonds. Yeah, yeah. And of course, the whole a lot of younger people now have grown up with uh, TikTok and the internet and Netflix and Amazon and don't think about going to the cinema to see something on the big screen. Mm, Doesn't yeah. mean anything to, to now they've got mm. dulled into this uh, TikTok era and um, internet era. Uh, it, it doesn't mean any for, anything for them to have decent sound or decent picture. I mean, mm. I mean watching Casino Royale yesterday on the big screen in Pinewood Studios was mm. just magnificent. Yeah. Because the sound was and the picture were fantastic. Mm. But young people now today wouldn't realize that. Doesn't mean a thing. No, no I mean, I, they've been releasing all the bonds because of the 60th anniversary. And every weekend, for pretty much without fail, I, I've been seeing the old, the old ones on the screen. And, and you, yeah. you can't beat that sort of present presentation. Um, and after Daniel being such a big bond, where do you go from, yes. from there, you know? Yes, it's going to be it's going to be quite interesting. Mm. But but having said that about the audience, uh, audiences, um, they're also quite forgiving. Mm. Um, memories are very short. Yeah, and uh, uh, you know, just for instance, you take Doctor Who. Mm. Now that's had about ten different Doctor Who's. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Over the period, I mean, I wouldn't know that. Yeah, even even went to a, a female Doctor mm. Who, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it still has quite a good following. Mm. With, 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 with any bond, there's always going to, as you say, people have such an idea of what what they what their bond is or their Doctor Who. So people have a strong strong idea of what something sh should be like. Um, do you think that Barbara and Michael uh, Wilson really? Uh, they must have nerves of steel sometimes to sort of make some decisions that they do and to hold fast, not bend to pressures. How, how are they as, 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 as um, leaders of, of the franchise? Difficult to say. I mean, when we were looking for a, a, a new bond to, 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 to take over from Pierce to do Casino Royale, mm. we tested quite a few people. Yeah. And, um, Barbara was very keen to have Daniel, hmm. but um, uh, there were, you know, people who thought, oh, um, he's not right, this sort of stuff. But uh, and if you remember, he got quite a lot of bad press when oh, he was it was, first announced. It was awful. Um, but uh, she was right. And um, I think you sort of have to sense the mood of what's going on in the world. Hmm. You know, with yeah. other films and stuff like that, and and uh, what's going on, um, and it's 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 going to be interesting because what the world is moving away from suits and ties and dinner jackets and what have yeah. you. That sophisticated world now is Slopsville. Mm. It's just jeans and t-shirts, mm. um, and uh, it's you can't have a you can't have a bond in jeans and t-shirts. he has got to be sophisticated and uh, mm. uh, because that's who the original bond was. Mm. And yeah. um, he doesn't have to smoke anymore, but <laughs> for those wonderful Sobrani cigarettes or whatever mm. they were. Yeah. Um, I mean, not many people know what a vodka martini is. No, it, it, yeah, how do you keep yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I thought No Time to Die was, whether people liked it or not, at the very least, it was very gutsy and it was, to, to, really was, took a bit a big gamble. And I personally loved the, the, the ending. A lot of fans hated it, others weren't sure, but they're not afraid to mix it up, which I think is, is a big part of this success. Yeah, no, it was, it was quite interesting how... Um, uh, it turned out that but, but when you say the ending, you mean in the opposite, in the, finished up in the pool, didn't it? The... Oh, I, I was well. I was thinking, um, oh. uh, yeah, yeah. But first of all, about license to kill being very 
a, a, a step away from previous entries, but also oh, right. also yeah. also say with no time to die, where you have you know a, a very different um, mm. conclusion. Yes, that's true. So I mean, it, it, it's it's always it's you you might be so afraid just to keep it like this that it would just fizzle away and die. But the producers always yeah. seem to be very, and I think that's yeah. very fortunately familiar. that's not my problem. No, no, but, yeah. that was yeah. not my problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, how how did how did you um, find um, Cubby Broccoli? Because I understand he wasn't too well when. I'm sorry, uh, Cubby Broccoli. Because I think uh, Cubby. Um, yeah. No, uh, he did come down to Mexico City, mm. but Mexico City, which is what five thousand feet, is quite high and very yeah. polluted. Mm. It's a very polluted city, even those days. I think we only saw the mountains around the ta- the city once oh. in nine months. Yeah. Um, he came down for a few days, a couple of times, I think, but he he couldn't take it. Mm. He couldn't yeah. take the pollution. Mm. Um, and I think that, I'm, no, I must have seen him at a premiere, but um, mm. I, I, I didn't see him many more times after that. No, no, uh, mm. but but Michael and, and Barbara very easily. Well, it, it seemed effortless, but of course it must have been quite a responsibility for them to take over. At, you know that. Yes, yeah. I mean Barbara was. Um, uh, Michael had obviously been around much longer and had been writing mm. scripts, and Barbara had sort of worked her way up through the ranks mm. and had a good eye, um, so she was quite easy to step in. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we were a good team around her as well. You know, yeah, why we yeah. were there. Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, you mentioned quite a, a good location. The the, the 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 pool scene at the end of *License to Kill* and Sanchez's um, wonderful villa that he has. Oh, right. um, It must have been quite nice to meet the owners of these kind of places. It must have been quite interesting people that. Well, you that was in Acapulco. Yeah, that was down in Acapulco, and that was a friend of Cubby's. Mm. And yeah. um, when we went down there on the recce, I remember we we sat at a large table by that pool and had a very nice dinner. Mm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, yes, that was a beautiful, beautiful house. But yeah. of course, since since then, Acapulco has gone downhill very much. It's very corrupt mm. and dangerous now. Yeah. I believe. Yeah. Hmm. Sad. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing how things do do, do change. Um, do you have any uh, particular memories of any of the, the, the main cast of Licence to Kill? That the main having? cast? Uh, the main cast, maybe Robert Dalvey or Carrie Lowell or people of that nature? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think um, they... Um, they all came in and did mm. the job and behaved themselves. And uh, mm. um, I don't, um, I think they all kept themselves busy. I mean, because the trick was in Mexico City was to, uh, you know, what, what do you do? You're living in a hotel room for nine months and you go out to eat. And mm. <laughs> it was quite tricky. So I, I guess they all kept themselves occupied. I don't think any. We had any trouble from boredom or anything like that? Was it more that you would did the crew pretty much stay with the crew and the actors for the actors, or did you kind of all kind of? Because I think it was nine months. I think you said you were there for. Yeah, well, of course, we the actors weren't there for that time. I mean, oh, we, no, no. we had three, four, three, four months yeah. prepping before they came out. Mm. Um, no, I think we all meet up in restaurants, or what have you. I mean, we Timothy often used to come out with us. Um, mm to one of our we had several restaurants which were our favorites and uh, we had those well organized mm. um I, I think for me one of the nicest things about license to kill is the fact that desmond llewellyn has such a prominent role in, in, in the yes. film. yeah I, I get a sense he must have really enjoyed that that expanded role and do, do you remember desmond at all yeah no i mean desmond um i mean again he he used to we used to take him out to, or he used to join us for dinner Hmm. Um, and we, you know, you catch up on the stories, and it was, it was, you always entertain yourselves. 
um, mm. as a group. You, you, you know, it's a you've got to enter. Is you just got to keep yourself occupied. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and keep busy, and the hours were long as well. So mm. very often, I mean, very often I didn't eat at night because I was worked mm. too late. But uh, mm. um, um, and we had. Um, down in the in, in, near the main square, the, the Zocalo in Mexico City. It's the second largest square in the world after Red Square. Hmm. And there was the theatre, the Bella Bellas Artes, and um, we would very often go there on a Saturday or a Sunday, a Saturday evening or a Sunday lunchtime. They had hmm. concerts or they had um, singers or musicians. They were quite good fun. Yeah, yeah. and of course. It, there was always a, a nearby restaurant you could go to afterwards, and hmm. and you walk back across the park, and uh, and just with all the rats running around you, giant <laughs> rats raiding the the litter bins and whatever. Yeah. Yes, that was quite fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, how long would would you go on for? Because uh, I take you would join Peter Lamont to do a location recce, and you would would you be would or would you? Um. On, yeah, on that film, mm. we probably, I, I don't know, but we, uh, we would have been quite a small crew initially out there to start with. Mm. Um, Peter Lamont, and a, an art director and, and a construction manager maybe, and the accounts department and uh, ourselves, and we would find the locations like any, any film. Mm. any bond film and, and um you'd find your locations get permissions um and schedule it schedule it in and budget it in all that sort of stuff but mm. um and of course we built quite a lot on the stages mm. when we got them yeah uh, and and did, did you try and import as many uk crew members as possible or, or were you was it um yeah, we we brought in quite a few, quite a lot of crew. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, obviously, your editors and sound and um, uh, camera crews, second mm. unit. Um, oh, it was, yeah, art department. We had and production office. We had a pretty big organisation. Yeah. Um, I mean, you you had to. You couldn't, and you pick up the local crew as well. So mm. obviously. Um, mm. We had a uh, Mexican production office and accounts, and mm. and uh, of course it was very. I don't know what it's like now, but in those days you had a sensor sit yes. on the set to watch right. what you shot. Yeah, and uh, if I remember correctly, the one we had, she was a lady. She was a pain in the neck, and right. threatened us that if it looked like Mexico, she wouldn't allow it in the film. Well, it, we gave well, her a little bit. Get a short, short shrift. I think <laughs> <laughs> it, it was obviously a fairly sensitive subject, given where you were yeah. shooting. Yeah. So yes, I think they were very, very nervous mm. um, of of the subject. Yeah. And um, but um, uh, we sort of overcame her, and mm. uh, uh, not much she could do really, but. <laughs> Well, I suppose the fact that it was set in a fictional place, Isthmus City, yeah. and it was, yeah. of course, there are references to it being south of the border and all that sort of thing, but it's uh, enough to, not to get too worried about it. I, I would, I would, no, I, I, I don't know what it's like nowadays, whether that's changed or not. Um, hmm. I can't remember. Um, I don't know, but the, um, yeah, I, I mean that we did have a lot of problems. I, I I know when we we moved up to Cancun to shoot the underwater sequence, which which I, we did quite early on. I think we did it as a pre-shoot. Um, uh, we had quite a few problems there, right? And um, and I I remember that the, we had a storm blew our set away before we <laughs> underwater set destroyed it before we even finished. Right. Hmm. But, um, and then we getting weapons and that sort of stuff was a, uh, when we had our first uh, shipment of guns come in, 
Hmm. Uh, 22 policemen, or no, t- military, they were military. 22 military accompanied the guns. Right. And they, uh, they were dummies. You know, hmm. they, they'd fire blanks, but I mean, they wouldn't fire real, yeah. real li- live ammo. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but of course, they were all jumping on the bandwagon. It was great fun. They got a free lunch. <laughs> wow. So I suppose again that it, it was budget reasons why you couldn't go to the Bahamas to shoot the underwater signatures as because that would have been the traditional thing to do to go to the Bahamas and shoot all the underwater um, uh, stuff. Well, yeah, I mean the the, the water is, is was as clear up there than it is in the Bahamas because that's why you went to the Bahamas is to get the clarity. Yeah. In in the water. Mm. Um, uh, from yeah and, and we had of course uh, there was a, an underwater cameraman, cameraman who lived up there uh, mm. Ramon Bravo uh, who was quite famous at the time mm. um, and he lived in Cancun and I think that's why we went up there yeah yeah um, do you have any other highlights from the film that we haven't already mentioned that you'd like to uh Talk about. Any what, sorry? Any other highlights or memories of the film that we haven't t- touched on? Um, no, I don't think so. I think we... Mm. You always... You overcome the problems that you have with the, mm. um, the, the sensors and the um, politics of the, of the city. You have to work mm. around and you know, the, the, the mayor always wants a donation to his charity, which is, mm. you never quite know where that goes, but um, mm. um, it eases the pain. Um, mm. No, I think um, um, it was, it was, it was not a pleasant film to work on mm. because of the, because of being in Mexico for so long. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um but we survived and you know you have your fun you you get the parties going on a saturday night or Mm. whatever Mm. and um we eventually got as always the film crew always gets a city organized yeah Um, they work out where to go and the best places I imagine that you base there for, for nine months and do you ever feel a bit sort of trapped in a spectacle because other locations you could probably go where you wanted at any time you wanted on your on your time off? Oh, you have- yeah, you feel yeah. very, very trapped, but um, mm. very trapped. Um, it gets very restrictive. You know, you live in a hotel room mm. for a long time and uh, you sort of maybe eat with the same crowd two or three nights a week and go to the same restaurants and uh, there isn't any and it's there's no greenery it's city it's pollution Mm. Uh, we did find a swimming pool on the roof of the hotel opposite um, but that was wasn't that good but I mean it was a little bit of a comfort Mm, yeah and um uh, I don't know. It's sort of. I guess when we, you know, with the hours being so long, you, you you grab a meal, you just want to have a shower and get to bed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. sort of thing. Hmm. Um, but I don't remember any. You know, very often, you know, you you'd have a the crew, you would have a party of some description laid on at the weekend and and you did get the breaks away you know we we did we did go up to cancun and we did go to mexicali and we did go to key west and we did go down to acapulco and we did go to where did we shoot the uh, sequence at toluca i think it was somewhere hmm. some uh, uh, dreary place where um where we shot the exterior of the temple oh yes or whatever it was the um uh, I can't remember now what what, what he was. It's great, great to find that location. I think it's yeah. really great. Um, uh, and um, that was fairly fairly dreary. Well, I mean, and I I, I know that uh, my wife and I we dived down to um, 
I can't remember where it is now, the hotel where they shot 10 mm. with Dustin Hoffman and um, uh, I can't remember her name now. Bo, Bo Derek? Is it Bo Derek? But Bo Derek? Yeah, I think it was, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Um, that was, you know, great weekends like that. You know, that's a um, good fun. A couple of, couple of days off or something. If we had a, we might have had a, if you'd been night shooting and you had the Friday and Saturday and Sunday off, hmm. you could maybe dive away. Hmm. Something like that. That was quite good. Oh, very nice. Um, I did want to ask about associate producer Tom Pevsner. I don't know if you remember mm -hmm. uh, Pevsner. What, what, in terms of what time, what your relationship would be as production supervisor and his and whether you'd have much to do with well, each other. Tom, Tom had done um, several of the bonds. Yeah. And in those days, associate producer would be now what an executive producer is. Yeah. Uh, there's now probably six or seven associate producers on a film that haven't got a clue what they're doing. Mm. Uh, but there's, you know, there's always the guy at the top. That does. So Tom was the associate producer, and I, I mean, I had a good working relationship with Tom. He was very, very stiff and. I was much more practical, mm. and um, but we, we we worked well. Mm. We worked well together. Uh, the, the last location I want to, to mention on *License to Kill* is um, going back to the tanker chase sequence. I believe there were lots of accidents and spooky things that were happening during that shoot. Was that something that you were? Which with? one shoot was this? Oh, um, during the tanker chase sequence. That was there was um, it's supposed to be a cursed area, and it was spooking a lot of the crew and things of that nature not really no mm. i mean with the sequence like that obviously um mm. there's bound to be the odd accident but it wasn't mm. too bad I mean, oh yeah i don't think there was any real no i don't know obviously no one on mm. the crew was there, but i think it was just one of those places where you it's like i suppose like going to anywhere of a reputation you bring a feeling with you a, a little bit and well it was a dreary mm. it, it was a pretty dreary location mm, and yeah. the poor crew living in those hotels up there, um, there wasn't much to do. Yeah, you probably end up seeing the shadows, you know, yeah, yeah. shadow after a while. Yes. Yeah, I mean, there wasn't much to do. I mean, they were, um, yes, I think they were pretty glad to get out of there. Mm, okay, I can imagine. Um, so uh, to the brain. Uh, but when I joked to, uh, yeah, it's been a weird day today, hasn't it? Um, when, when I spoke to J John Glenn, he was, he knew when he was making Lies of the Kill, that was going to be his last, his, his last Bond film. So was there therefore a slight tinge of sadness that John was moving on? And No, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. I mean, we're all freelance people and, you know, every film could be your, not your last, but I mean... Yeah. It could be the last one that, and you move on to another film. You're not available for the next Bond or something like that. It's uh, um, uh, no, I don't think I. Um, you know, we've all been freelance, but you come, people come and go. It's, it's so, part of life, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you yeah. you might work with someone for four films, and then they're not available or mm. they life changes for them or that sort of thing mm. yeah. yeah it's difficult i mean i think john had had a good run oh yeah I, I think after a while you want something a new challenge don't you i think it's yeah how else can you what, you probably run out of ways to blow something up you know after, after <laughs> what, you know, yeah. change yeah. direction um uh, so, so when you come to say the, the, the premieres and the and and is is that always a a lovely experience and do you have any you know lots of fun memories from things like the premiere um i've got to go in a minute so. okay yeah sure um yeah. premieres um yes i mean generally uh, when i was around in the studios i'd have a lot of organization mm. to do with the premieres yes. but, well particularly the cast and crew screenings where you right. you know we maybe had five screens in leicester square you'd mm. have three or four thousand people Mm. Uh, you'd invite and you know, on a Sunday morning the whole of Leicester Square was everybody you knew mm. yeah. <laughs> um, and premieres were always um, 
political, difficult. Um, no, they weren't difficult. It was, it was more difficult from the producer's point of view because there mm. was obviously who do you invite, who do you don't invite, where do you sit people, yeah, and who's in the lineup. Mm. Um, uh, that was quite tricksy for for the producers. I mean, I would have to do a little bit of organisation, maybe. Uh, you get involved, you know, flying people in and hotels and transport and all that sort of thing, cars for them. Um, no, they were always quite good fun. Hmm. I can't yeah. remember the premiere of uh, of Licence to Kill. I can't remember who 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 the royal was who went there. Hmm. Um I don't, it wasn't the Queen, I'm pretty sure. It must have been Charles and Diana, I think. Yeah, I, 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 would, I think, imagine it would have been, yes. yes yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I can't remember if I went to the American premiere. Hmm. Um, I probably would have done, yeah. I would have gone to the American premiere as well. I don't know. Or maybe hmm. not on that one. Um, maybe later on I, I would go hmm. to those when I became associate producer or something. Hmm. And I took over from Tom. And my final question for you is just how, what do you think of Licence to Kill as, as a film? Is it rate highly on your radar Bond films? Do you enjoy um, it? <clears throat> I did watch a lot of it the other night. Um, I think it's, it's um, I didn't think a lot of the action sequences were as good as um, some we've done. Mm. I think a lot of them were, I felt the film was, a, in a way, a little, the subject was a little bit drab. Yeah. Uh, yeah. wasn't exciting. Um, but the sequences were good and the actors were good. I mean, it mm. was, it, it couldn't. Um, um, I think, um, yeah, I think Mexico, the Mexicali sequence was pretty good. The, the, the tanker sequence was pretty good. Mm. I, yeah. Um, the the cult religious no he wasn't religious but the the cult sequence oh, uh, uh, I uh, think uh, that was where the drugs went or all that sort of stuff I think yeah. that was a little bit um, tame mm. but, um, yeah. I, I I guess <coughs> that was a story we got lumbered with or we made it <laughs> you didn't feel oh, that was too dark, or oh, we shouldn't have done that. You, oh, no. You no, I, did, I never worry about that sort of thing. That's no. not my... But, but as, 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 a, as a viewer watching it years well, later, I, I you mean, don't mind it too much? I, you know, when we, when we view the sequences, cut sequences very early on in the post-production, and mm. one goes to, to see them, and you sit there with the lights go up, and Michael Wilson or Barbara will say, <clears throat> what do you think? And you voice your opinions, and and um, some get accepted, mm. and some are obvious, and some get, um, um, you know, kicked out out of the out of the way. So you mm. you have a little, but of course on that one, uh, I didn't have much to do with post production because mm. I I finished in Mexico and it went on, whereas an later bonds i was on for the full post-production mm. um so i would have seen the film in many stages mm. as it progressed and changed mm. and quickly Anthony, did did um was the post-production done it back in england for license to kill was it all done in mexico was it um, no uh, back in england yeah yeah, yeah yeah we moved everything back yeah yeah we we um mm. uh we shifted everything back um I, think, I can't remember. I think, if I remember, we had a couple of big containers, mm. and and the film would have come gone gone back. Um, we had that shoot. I think we processed much of that in in the states in Los Angeles, mm. and that would have been shift shifted from LA back to Pinewood or Denham or whatever. With mm. we would have done the post production in Pinewood if I remember. You don't get a little nervous waiting for those films to come from halfway across the world and. You know, it's, it's like uh, yes, where well, you yeah. have to be a bit cautious, you don't yeah. sort of ship it all at once or something like that. I mean, you, um, 
it can be quite tricksy. Uh, you know, when film was film, and you you have the original negative, it's oh. uh, quite a tricky number to. So you don't send it all in one package. Yeah. Um, you you, um, you would shift it around, and you'd have a master. You'd have a master copy anyway. But yeah, yeah. It wasn't yeah. the you know the original leg was the original leg. And, yeah. And yeah. Mm. So it's quite tricky to do all that. Mm. But I have to go, Phil. I'm afraid. Oh yeah, yeah. That, that's everything I wanted to ask you. But thank you very much for for um, chatting to me. It's been it's been great. All right. Take care now. Take care. All the best. Bye now. Bye. Bye bye. Bye now. During my 48 years as a business, I've met some wonderful technicians who over the years have become almost friends. And after, after the Bond film, I, I did three Bond films. Uh, and uh, at the end of the uh, production, they used to, uh, uh, John and John Grover and Matt Glenn used to organise a holiday for the whole crew. We all contributed to it. Um, and we went to some lovely places. The first, after four eyes only, we, the whole crew plus wives went to the Isle of Wight. Great time. Uh, second, we went to Somerset. Can't remember the town we went to, but it was a good, good holiday. And I suppose it was about fifteen people. And the last one, we went to uh, Matt and John organised a, a trip to Deauville, France. Um, Matt arranged for the coach. We were to meet at Pinewood at 4.30 in the morning. We waited till 6, no coach. It didn't turn up. The guy that was uh, running it, I think, did a runner. <laughs> so we all got in there, quickly got into our cars, and we drove down to Portsmouth and picked up the ferry. But we also had transport arranged for the the other side. Hmm. But somehow that didn't appear either. Anyway, we, we got to our location, location. It was a lovely hotel, we had a great time. Um, but we were lot, the money was lost on the first coach. I don't hmm. know what happened about the second coach. Hmm. Uh, and Cubby Broccoli, being the generous man he was, he refunded the cost of the coach, hmm. which was um, but we were all very grateful to him. Um, but Cabe Broccoli was a, a lovely man, mm. and I haven't heard him, a bad word spoken about him. Uh, often that, every Christmas, uh, going back several years now, we used to have a Christmas do, mainly editorial, but everybody was invited to want to come. Uh, and uh, that was held at, at Pinewood. But with the change of management, that all ceased. And we eventually ended up, only what, three or four years ago, at the Cookwood Billet in Ivor, mm -hmm. where we get a, got about 70 or 80 people in attendance. I, again, a, a very nice reunion of all members, and some from other branches used to come, but mainly it was editorial. Mm -hmm. But often that, uh, they developed um, a group called the Sprockets. Hmm. How it, uh, who gave it them, I've no idea. But anyway, it uh, consists of retired analog, people that worked on analog sound. Hmm. Totally different from what it is now. And uh, when it was, when it gradually uh, was introduced in the business, that's when I decided to leave the business. Hmm. Because I've seen so many changes over the years that I didn't, at the age of 65, I didn't want to start up again. Yeah. It's a totally different business now. Mm. Uh, everything's so different. Since I retired, um, 
I'm a, I'm a great film fan. I don't watch television, but I have a collection of DVDs, which is nearly 5,000. Mm. And most evenings I watch a different film. Um, I have my own little cinema set up, nine speakers in my room, yeah. and a large drop down screen, mm. and a good projector, a sonic mm. projector. And it's, it's uh, been a, a good invest, investment. Yeah, because yeah. it uh, it's a happy way to end the to end the end the day. How did I start working on the bonds? <clears throat> well, I I was working in Poland at the time on a TV series, a short short home TV series, mm -hmm. and I got a call from my wife saying that they want to on the bond, and uh, I thought about it. I was, I was going to be the dialogue editor. Mm -hmm. So after a period, I, 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 I found my wife and I said, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll join the Bond. I can't remember exactly when I started on. It was For Your Eyes Only. So that would have been shooting um, 1980, 81 sort of time, yeah. Yes, yeah, so it would be halfway through post production, maybe. Mm. So it must have been, yeah, uh, 81, yeah. But, um, the thing about the Bond is, I knew John Glenn mm. from 1953, mm. and we were quite good mates. We were assistants at Twickenham Studios together, yeah. not working on the same film, mm. but uh, I can't think. I think he was working on Spoilers of the Sea. Mm. Quite a, a, a well known direct, American director, but I was working for Renown Pictures. I'm probably a dance little lady, which was a B picture. Yeah. At Tem at Walton on Thames Studios. Mm. Anyway, John and I we grew a friendship, and we used to go to Silverstone together. Mm -hmm. um, he used to have, arrive at my flat. I was married then. Yeah. Uh, and he used to have a baby Austin seven. And I had a big horse in 16. So we used to go in my car. And we had two or three occasions at Silverstone. Mm -hmm. But uh, but John's uh, work went one way and mine went the other. Mm. Uh, he went, well, I learned, we lost contact for some time. He was working as a sound editor and he worked as an editor. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he, he did a couple of TV shows before we ever went on. Bond. Anyway, yeah. I met up with him again. He did Murphy's War. He was second unit director on Murphy's War. Mm. Anyway, I've diversed from uh, what I was talking about. Anyway, I joined the crew at Pinewood as a dialogue ed editor. And the assistant was Joe Illing. Mm. My assistant was Joe Illing. And, and he was a bit of a hippie, hmm. but Joe and I got on so well. And uh, in our spare time, we used to have a game te table tennis at hmm. Pinewood. It a nice room, table tennis room. Not there now, it's all different to Pinewood Studio. Um, but Four Your Eyes Only wasn't the best film, but it was uh, an introduction. And. The next one was Living Daylights. Yeah. Well, Colin wasn't available to, to start with, so I was on Living Daylights for eight, six or eight weeks before Colin joined, and he was in charge of the uh, of the sound, mm -hmm. post production sound, um, and Derek Holding did did the, the uh, who's deceased now died a few years ago. He did the dialogues and I did the effects. I did all the guns and mm. bombs and explosions. Um, it was a happy, happy film. Yeah. And we went to after as I mentioned previously, we we went to Somerset. Mm. Yeah. Um, what did we? Yes, yeah, Somerset. Yeah. Uh, and then surprisingly. When uh, License to Kill 
I got the message from Matt, uh, John's son, mm -hmm. that he wanted me to, do, to, to take charge of the sound on Master to Kill. Mm. Yeah. But the original title of Master to Kill was License Revoked. Mm. Yeah. Um, but it, it, I didn't, the explanation was the Americans didn't understand Revoked. Mm. So that's when it was changed. Um, I went to, I was finishing on uh, Circles in the Forest uh, and I got a note here that said I ended Circles in the Forest in July 1988. Uh -huh. uh, John and Matt, I think, f virtually flew from Johannesburg. Mm. I didn't know if they went home or flew straight to Mexico City. But at any rate, I really left to, to clear up for about a week. Mm. And I, found, I finally ended up in July 1988. And I see of my notes here that uh, I, I started License to Kill in the 21st of November. No, I, that's wrong, that one. Yes, I started uh, on, on um, License to Kill on 21st of November, yeah. 1988. Yeah, the film came out in July 19, uh, sorry, 89, so, so yeah, November would have been roughly yes. the, a good start time, yeah. Uh, um, but before I, I, I joined them, I don't think I did anything between Circles in the Forest hmm. and License to Kill, but my wife came out to Johannesburg and we had a, a holiday in uh, Neisner, mm. which I've said previously mm. was a beautiful spot, but that was 30 odd years ago. Yeah. yeah. What it's like now, I've no idea, but I was mm. always re recommended to go on the garden route from Cape Town. Mm. It's beautiful. Yeah. Anyway, um, I, fl I flew to Mexico City. Uh, and uh, I was met by an agent who saw me through customs, mm. but he made me wait for a, a bit. He said, I've got a, a job to do. He went and bought a bottle of whiskey mm. for the customs man. Right. <laughs> so there was no problem with customs. Mm. But apparently they had some problems. Uh, I, I don't know what they were. Mm. So I joined the crew, but the first day there, was a hol I think a holiday mm. because it was the, at the hotel we were staying at there was a big march past of the army and so forth so I took a lot of my records I wanted to record the, the footsteps of the soldiers marching mm. but they all were, were in rubber soles <laughs> <laughs> so there was no no effects there mm. but uh, the whole was the crew that was staying at the hotel watched the parade. Uh, I don't know how far they got into shooting, but I joined the crew pretty early in the stage of shooting. Because just what John liked to do was he would cut a sequence and he'd like it roughed up mm. yeah. to see what it would look like. So. Uh, John Grover had cut off a couple of sequences. So I went in, I took the sequence into a small dubbing theatre in the studio. Oh, the, the studio was called Tirabusco Studios. Mm. It was, I suppose, about a half a mile ride. The thing I, I was impressed again, mm. Mexico City was a bit like Havana. Yeah. They have all these old big American cars. Right. And this car used to pick us up every morning. It was a, it was a huge thing. <laughs> but breakfast was always at the top of, top of the hill, top of the hotel, and you could see the whole of Mexico. But by the time we'd finished breakfast, it was a grey mist. Oh. It was totally polluted. Yeah. 
And the area that we went into was a pollution area because it was, we drove into it. Mm. Uh, at, um, anyway, uh, this we got picked up every day and brought home. It was a long working day, not that I did much to start with. Uh, and we, we were stayed for rushes every night and we got back to the house at about 8.30 8 every night. And then we went out to eat, so it was always a, a late. Um, during that time, Matt brought his wife out with a young baby, hmm. uh, which was a, a bit of a hazard having to take a baby around every night. Yeah, but at any anyway, rate, it, it worked out somehow. Hmm. But um, at the studio, I organised a dubbing theatre to do this this sequence. Mm. It was the bar fight where Bond draws up in a in a, a launch. Oh uh, yeah, the big speedboat. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, we worked for two days on this sequence, and it was backwards and forward, backwards and forward. I never could get a sound. Of, I know John Lawrence. Mm. So I said to John, I said, I don't it's worth dubbing here really because I'm never going to please you with what they can produce. It's not sharp enough, not crisp enough. And so he said, well then forget it. Enjoy yourself while you're here. <laughs> so I used to go to the studio every day. I used to find jobs to do. I recorded a lot of sound effects. Uh, one of the facts, I thought, how am I going to make this? Well, they had a, a fire brigade in the studio. Mm. And they had a, a big water tank. And I thought, yeah, okay. So I got them, I got the fire brigade, got a great big sheet of plastic put over this water tank. Mm -hmm. It was a round water tank. I don't know how many guns it had, but it was a big pipe bit. Mm. And I got them to shoot a hose at full pressure on this plastic. Mm. And, it, and it worked very well mm. for the seaplane mm. when Bond is being towed along. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but now, if it was made, you could probably do it with a hose in a bucket of water with plastic over it. Mm. And with digital sound, you can do miles with it. Yeah. But I was pleased with that. Mm. One of the other things I used to go is they had a small zoo in Cherubusca Studios. Mm. And it was full of rats. They had cages of rats. And they had several big snakes in mm. cages. And there was a rattlesnake there. I used to touch the glass mm. or whatever it was, plastic. He shoot out at me. <laughs> But they used to breed these rats to feed these snakes. Oh yeah, yeah, feel that yeah. life food, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. 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 The yeah. other thing I recorded was I did a stereo recording of machine guns mm. inside a stage. Yeah. I used a long shot and a close up. Mm. And they're quite effective. Yeah, I had a little cassette recorder mm. which were at the time were very high quality. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if I ever used them, mm. but that was uh, mainly for the fish tank sequence. Oh yeah, yeah, in, in, yeah, in Key, but, Key West, yeah. What was the other thing? Oh, yes, we, when uh, we got back to England, I spent, oh, I spent 10 weeks in, the unit spent 10 weeks, maybe John and that spent long, but I spent 10 weeks in Mexico City. Mm. It was a nice experience. Uh, on one occasion, we hired one of the uh, large American cars for a Sunday trip. Mm -hmm. We went to some sort of park or I don't know where these sort of dressed up barges mm. went along this river course and music playing. You got served the meal. Mm. It was a nice experience. I, I don't I remember much. I can't remember what it was called. 
But on the on the way there, I remember we were stopped by the police, and John. We all wanted to know why we'd been stopped. Well, the guy, the driver we hired for the day, the student driver. There was something wrong, wrong with his, superficially wrong with his, um, was not was passport. It, um, yeah, it's his papers or... Paper, oh, with his papers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it was a backhander for, for the police. And John attempted to be there. No cameras, no mm -hmm. cameras. But it was a backhander. Yeah. Yeah. So we were... Well on our way, but we held up for ten minutes, you know. Mm. But, um, but corruption at that stage in in uh, Mexico, I was told, was severe. Well, when I was talking to Anthony Way, the production supervisor, yes. when he was budgeting for the film, he had to put in a budget for for bribes and because um, oh, you know people would expect you to pay him for or like the whiskey yeah, in, in, yeah. in the airport. So there was. They knew that they would be taken advantage of, and so they'd have to pay this or pay that. Oh, yes. So they had to budget a that's certain the way amount. It that's they the knew it was going into it, that it would. That's yeah, how it worked that's out there. That's yeah. the way it works, that yeah. I have here a, a picture of the of Sanchez, the bad man of the film. Uh, it was quite a character. John tells me that uh, if you look at the picture closely, mm -hmm. yeah. We can see that, yeah. I'll you'll say, you'll say his I'll left hand in. side. Yeah. He's quite scarred. Yeah. Just if you want to hold it up just a bit higher, Vernon. Yeah. Yeah, that's lovely. Yeah. And he was very conscious of that, and then he used to ring John in the <laughs> quite often, saying, "I hope you're showing the best side of me on the film." Mm. Uh, but he was quite a nice guy. I remember one occasion he invited Matt and John and myself out for an evening meal. Mm. He obviously had a soft spot for this Italian place, and whether he knew the proprietor or not, I don't know. But he virtually took over. He was quite a wild character, mm. and he uh, he, took, he virtually took over the restaurant. And he, I don't even matter if he even cooked the meal for us. I don't know, but mm. but uh, it was certainly a good evening. Yeah, and I quite liked him. Uh, I've, I've, these, he hasn't done much since since that film, mm. uh, unless they were all B pictures. Mm. But it was uh, a, a, quite a change from a normal Bond villain. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I thought the film deserved more than it got. Actually, I thought it was mm. one of the better better Bonds mm. because it was different. One of the leading ladies in the, in the film was Carrie Noble, um, and she and the editing crew plus the floor crew hired a plane one weekend and flew down to, I think, Montego Bay, it was one of those areas, and uh, had a great time out here. But I didn't go because I, I just wanted to rest up, mm. and I went. I spent that day in an amusement park opposite the hotel where we were staying and I shot sound effects, roller coasters and so forth. Quite frightening on the roller coaster, the recording. Mm. <laughs> Going down was, I nearly lost my, my recorder actually. <laughs> uh, but I had a quite an enjoyable day. And the other thing I had John do for me one, there was a swim, it was an indoor swimming pool in the hotel. Mm. I got John Grover to dive in the pool and I had this microphone with a French, two French letters on it hmm. and I wanted him to call genuine underground, under, underwater so, services. Yeah. But uh, we worked, worked for about an hour but it didn't work hmm. and I ruined two microphones in the process. <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah. but John said, oh, the things you make me do. Yeah. Uh, but I think you it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's just a little incident. Mm. Well, I could just say that everywhere I went to for the last six years of my working life, mm. 
I, I took up recorder everywhere. Yeah, yeah. I recorded dog. I, I, my mother's, my mother lived in Crookland in Somerset, mm. and she had a lovely church just down the road. Mm. And I spent one whole evening, up to one th about one thirty in the morning, yeah. recording bells. Right. Uh, Charlie every fifteen minutes. Yeah. I mean, you could use the same. Yeah. Just chop one of them out and wait. But yeah. I, and my mother got quite worried about me because I was out so long. But uh, I've used that bell mm. in quite a lot of films. Right. And especially in Life Force, it is. It's, uh, if you yeah. listen to it, you can hear it. Mm. Yeah. But uh, I can't remember what else I've used it for. But it's. it's well, it was one of my beautiful tracks, actually. Yeah. Night, night atmosphere. Mm. And I often used to hang out the microphone at night time, getting countryside atmospheres at night, mm. distant cow mooing. Mm. Uh, no, I really loved it. I love work. I love working on sound. Yeah. Uh, I love being. I love being creative. Yeah. Mm. You said Princess Margaret visited Pinewood Studios. Was it just a? A royal oh, we were going to talk you, about Pinewood in the you, old days. Yeah, that's that thing's nice under Pinewood, yeah. Uh, I might have mentioned it previously, I don't know. Mm. Right. Um, Pinewood Studios. Um, my first experience of Pinewood Studios was we did the final recording and the final mix at Pinewood on Our Girl Friday. Mm. And then it was a, compared to what it is today, it was quite a small, it was, I suppose it was rather the bigger studio. Mm. But there was a, a nice family feel about it. Mm. And instead of the, the great Hollywood entrance like it is now, it was a small house, you know, a small, uh, I don't know what you call it, a lot house. Yes, yeah, it's most, uh, and you went in. Yeah. Yeah. I had a commission there, you got a salute every morning, plenty of places to park, and it had a nice bar, and a, a nice restaurant, and had a worker's restaurant. It's no longer there, it's all gone. Mm. And my last experience at Pinewood was trying to get in there for a, a Monday night, as is a good cinema show in Theatre 7. Mm. Yeah, the, is, your, is your name on the list, sir? Well, I hope it is. So it goes down the list. You have to pre-book. And then you have to go through another security, and there was another security as you go near the theatre. Mm. And to get parked in, in private then, even then, this was going back. I hadn't, I hadn't seen a show there, but there's no shows now. The new administration just washed it out. Yeah, yeah. There's no it's show tough. at Pinewood now. Yeah. Which was, which was a benefit of being on to the GBFE. Mm. Uh, it's changed. And uh, my last view of Pinewood was. They've now built about another six actual studios yeah. across on the other field, across the main road, mm. or the road to the former. So I'm told now Disney has bought it. Yeah, they've got a long-term lease on it. Yeah. yeah. And there are about, uh, there's going to be or are 28 studios. They're also building a big visitor centre, so people, oh, the members of the public, away from the main studio. So, because I think as a film fan, you want to go and see all the classic lots, of 007 stage, etc. Yeah. But they're building it separately, but still very. Uh, so it'll be like, um, you know, a, a, a tour for the public. Of uh, so that'd be quite interesting. Yes, I quite enjoy working on one because it's just a, a family atmosphere, mm. and. Uh, I don't know what made uh, license to kill. Did, apparently, didn't do too well in the box office. Not, not really, unfortunately. Because no. it was in composition with, was a very popular type, maybe, E. T. or something. Uh, it had um, uh, the Michael Keaton Batman film, 
and uh, also. Um, I know the Batman film. Uh, well, well, the, well um, the first Batman of Michael Keaton was 89, that was summer of 89, oh, was it? so oh. that would have been competition, but yeah. also Lethal Weapon 2, Mel Gibson, Danny Glover, those two films are put yeah. fairly close to, and Indiana Jones, I think, the second, the second Temple I mean, Doom. What, uh, I suppose we all thought that uh, we got a job for light on it. Mm. Yeah. But it, uh, they, they completely changed everything. Yeah. And now they've got directors I've never heard of. Mm. Who was his last one? Oh, Kerry uh, Fukunawa. Um, who, and what's he done then? Uh, he, he did a, a, a TV series called True, True, True Detectives, I think it is. It's sort of a, a gritty... Oh, that was a good series. Yeah, so, so, so it was quite interesting. They've made some interesting choices in, in, yeah. in directors. Michael Apted was um, uh, d an interesting choice. He was more of a drama d director and he did The World's Not Enough. So they do have some very interesting, yeah. Martin Campbell, Edge of Darkness, the TV series, and so... But that True Detective yeah. was, uh, mm. I've, got, I've got the first yeah. and second series, Yeah. but the third series was not so good. I'm not quite sure which series he, he did, but he did, he, did, he did some of them, yeah. Um, uh, oh, uh, before... They had this, um, what's his name, this coloured actor, who was in Oh the Green Book? Have you ever seen it? Green Book. Uh, I know, but but it was a, a big thing at the time, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. It's a that funny get to see it again. Mm. It's one of the, my favourites really. Yeah. And the uh, soprano guy was the heavy in it. Oh right, yeah. Yeah. And he has to go on a he, someone tells him about an advert. For a driver wanted, mm. and, he, and he's just been maybe done them from this night. He's an outcome bouncer, mm. and he's a bit uncouth. And uh, when he goes to the interview, this colour guy comes out, all dressed like a Nigerian, mm. and you think, oh, "What's going on here?" But it's, he first refuses. Then he accepts, and it's a relationship, a build up of a relationship between the, the black guy and, and him. Yeah. Worth well, that sounds good, yeah. Um, I would think it's one of my favourites, really. Yeah. Got a very good review when it came out. I'll give, give that, that a go. Um, yeah. be before people, people watching this scream, scream at me, um, it was uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, the third one that was opposite License to Kill. Temple of Doom was 84, so it was like it was. Uh, Last Crusade and Batman and Lethal Weapon oh. too. That I, I got, oh. that, got that got it wrong first. Yeah. But yeah, a lot, lot of competition. I think also it had a, a 15 certificate um, in in the UK and of course the equivalent in America. Oh yes, so, yes, so yes. It, it, you can take your, your kids. Yeah, there. that's the that's the other thing. There was there was more violence in, mm. in Last of the Kill. Yeah, but I I, I think that was more real. I think I don't think Tim, I don't think Timothy Dalton was wrong in playing like that. No. They always said it, it's lost its humour, but uh, I think the action stuff. Oh, I can tell you one story about um, Last of the Kill. Mm -hmm. Yes. When we were uh, rough mixing, the final sequence lasted fourteen and a half minutes. Yeah. The um, tanker. Tanker chase, yeah. yeah. I had a lot of work there. Mm. And uh, Pete Musgrave, who was helping me out, we took half the half the reel each. It took us three days to do each. And when we were mixing with John John Haywood, John Haywood, mm. he was a mixer, very good mixer of them. And uh, I'd take, the, take all my stuff in the theatre, or the system, and I'd say, OK, John, I won't even sit with you. You know what I like. Mm. I'll leave you to it. Mm. And when he'd finished, now I did stay with him as I lied, because we came to the part where the t uh, Dalton and... Oh, Robert Darby? Robert, Robert Darby. Crash. Mm. 
to get time to go over the the, the um, clips. One thing. pulls out his lighter. Yeah. And sets him alight. Hmm. Well, we've actually now screamed there. I said, I'll do that. Yeah. So they set that mic up. And I just went into the, into being burnt alive, you know. I just felt mad. Yeah. And I said, John said, no, it's good. We'll keep that. I said, no, I can do better. No, no, no. We're happy with that. Hmm. But when the censor looked at the film, yeah. they cut it almost down to nothing. Yeah. So my performance was lost. Yeah. So, so even with the hard certificate, there were certain bits yeah. that they oh, got to. When I worked in Poland, yeah. I did all the English voices on yeah. the Sherlock Holmes TV series. Because the Polish people that they had, they had engaged, their English it was not particularly good. Hmm. So I, I did about six parts of, in in the, the series. Yeah. Uh, so, I enjoyed doing that. So it's almost like a, a different a different career path. You could have gone into voiceover work. Yeah, and, I, I, I just used to get into the mood hmm. and think, oh, I'm a priest, I'm a hotel manager. Hmm. There's almost a, an actor trying to get out yeah, there. Yes. Sort of, sort of and the, the lady that was working with me, she said, how do you change your voice? I said, I don't really think I'd change it, it's just the way I speak it, yeah. as opposed to changing the voice. Yeah. You know, the priest talks definitely to how to people. Mm. And I was a boxing promoter, you know. Uh, but I, I set up the looping system in, Poland, yeah, because they they didn't have this ADR looping, mm. but it's not it's rock and roll now, you know, and it's totally different. And I made up a we shot on sixteen mil, and I made up a, a loop, which was three times the length plus the leader mm. of the picture, and I did three takes it was fine. It was quite simple, really, as long as the loop didn't get entangled. Yeah, and, and I believe you did have a a, a voice role in in Labyrinth. Um, ah, yeah, only um, yeah. who goes for the yeah. giant. Yeah, the giant. Yeah. 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 And, uh, I mean, I, I pitched my voice as loud as I as low as I could get it, and they had a machine there, a pleeper song. I mean, it would be no trouble now with digital. Mm. And they, because it was the, the frequency slightly, yeah. and they dropped the voice down. Yeah. And it was never changed. Mm. Uh, uh. Oh, okay. I, uh, on Labyrinth, I used to have uh, my own little recording set up in the room. And Jim Henson used to come in. He said, Is your sister walking? I said, Yeah. He said, I want to do some little noises for these little. little Characters in 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 the in the film. Hmm. So it's interesting. I I, I love that Jim. Yeah. Nicest guy, nicest yeah. director I've ever worked for. Yeah. But he died of that film. Oh yeah, yes, yeah, so uh, very unfortunate, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, I mean, is there much of an approach from a sound editor's point of view in terms of the, the well, tone the, of the, the film? I and didn't find the Bond film completely different. No. There's a lot of work, but not different stuff. Yeah. The, the, the film that stretched me a bit was the uh, Life Force. Yeah, yeah, it was just, so science fiction and very sort of. Yes, yeah, yeah. Trying to create sounds from another world almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so there was a lot of experimentation on that. Yeah. But it all seemed to work yeah. for me. Maybe. I think the film, the thing that let down Life Force was the dummies were. The zombies were not uh, 100%, but they were good for the time. It was a bit of a budget issue, I think, wasn't there? Sort of some. Well, the budget was yeah. 24 million. Yeah. And apparently, uh, if you listen to the extras, yeah. uh, Toby Ho Hooper pleaded for an extra three day shooting, mm. and another, which put another 6 million on the budget, apparently. Stage 6 at EMI. Fantastic echo. And I got a hold of a, 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 a lid of a can of film yeah. and just went, 
Mm. First of all, fantastic noise. Yeah. Uh, I thought, well, I can't use that. <coughs> yeah. I don't know how I could use it a lot. Yeah. But it's just something I used to like to do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah just having those, those libraries and you, you never know what way yeah, you need it. Especially these days with the sort of films I'm making. Yeah. You need something different. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Which is where digital comes in, you do what you like. Oh, yeah. Yeah, much, much. Yeah, yeah. Much, much simpler. Oh, yeah. I was uh, demobbed in uh, May 1949, and I had some difficulty to get it back in the business. Well, not because of me personally, but because the Lime Grove, Shepherd's Bush Studios, the rank had closed. Mm. So that I, I was the first of the two years because of conscripts to come out and they didn't know where to put me. Yeah. Uh, and I started work at Denham Studios eventually after six weeks of, um, of um and I and where I should go. And I, I have to mention that the um, foreign people all started at Pinewood mm. on contracts. But my I was only engaged for one year's reinstatement. So the first film I worked on was uh, with Terence Young. The editor was Vera Campbell, and it was called They Were Not Divided. Mm -hmm. It was a war picture. Uh, I think maybe Windsor Davis' first picture that made him famous. Uh, it was, uh, I was on the film for some time, but not. Uh, but I got transferred to with Harry Miller on the sound, and that's where I, that's one reason I became a sound editor because I quite enjoy working with sound. Mm -hmm. Uh, and eventually, Vera Campbell and Terence Shannon were dismissed from the film, and Ralph Kemplin took it over. Mm -hmm. And that's when I got to know Ralph Kemplin, and Ralph Kemplin went on to, to do Pandora and the Flying Dutchman mm -hmm. at Shepherd and Studios. And, and I eventually went on because of uh, I got to know Ralph at Denham, mm -hmm. uh, to, I got the job. But going back to Terence Young, um, in around about 52, 53, I was working at Worden Park. Business was bad, so I was just getting a filling job. Mm -hmm. And the money was just about sufficient to, to survive on. And uh, that time I got, uh, it was around 52, I got married. So it wasn't all luxury when we started our lives together. Mm -hmm. But during the time there, um, I was working on documentaries, but occasionally feature films used to come in mm. and wanted an assistant to help the sound editor. Yeah. Well, Bob Wilson was the sound editor of this film came in. It's Terry Jones' film. can't remember what it was called, but it was, uh, I think John Clements, uh, quite a famous actor at the time, was a lead, and he's been accused of murder. And he's used to hang the following day. And the story basically is the effects on the family. Mm. Anyway, Bob was not a very busy worker. And I, I let me lay, uh, lay the, do the, a lot of the effects. So, again, part of my education. Mm. And after that, I didn't meet Terence until about 1973, 74. And I got called for a job to go to Rome on a film called The Valachi Papers. And uh, apparently Valachi was a, a gangster which denounced the, the Mafia. Mm -hmm. He ended up going to prison. Um, we had Joseph Wiseman playing the head uh, chief Mafia man. And I, the sound of the stage was not very good. And we had a lot of ADR work to do, and when I handed Terence the script, when we started ADR, and Terence took the script and said, I'm not doing all that. I said, Terence, the sound is not good coming off the stage. Mm. Italians weren't noted for quiet stages. Mm. Anyway, we got, Terence, we got Joseph Wyman, Wiseman back. I worked well, well with him. He's a nice guy, Joseph Wiseman. Mm. And then we did uh, Charles Bronson. Yeah. Well, Charles was not a great talker. 
and Terence was called away from the theatre and he, he left me with Charles to carry on the work. He said, but don't do this. No, I'm talking about different now. I've, got to, I've lost a bit. Hmm. That happened when we were doing Joseph Wiseman. Right, yeah. And Terence left the theatre and I carried on with Joseph Wiseman. And we were getting well together mm -hmm. and it was easy to work with. But Terence came back and we were doing a sixth session he had said don't do because I think there was money problems with the production and Joseph Wiseman. And he gave me a bit of a rollick in and I said, well, Terence, I just was to what you said. Anyway, oh, well, we finished. And then we started with uh, Charles Bronson. Well, we came to us one loop, or sat one section. I call it loops because we were still working with loops then. And we'd, we'd done the previous artist and there's a lot of camera noise in it. And I don't know the reason why uh, Terence reacted, but he said to Charlie, well, Charlie, don't do it if you don't want to. I said, Terence, we've got to do it because we've done the other artists and we can't have camera noise on one and not on the other. Mm. So I said, he said, forget it. So we did. And of course, when we came to the dubbing, he came rushing into my theatre one, one, my cutting room one day, and said, oh, Vern, I said, can you make us up a loop of that camera noise? And we put camera noise back on the, the man who was there, A.D. Yeah. It was crazy. I felt really annoyed, and I, and I was, was going to go in there and tear off a strip. I was a bit like that. And the guy I was working with, oh, with in sound, said to me, don't burn, it's not worth it. And I said, OK. But I was very annoyed. Yeah. But Terence was a nice guy, and mm. uh, he liked to play the big producer, yeah. or the producer and director, mm. and it was champagne all around after he'd finished in the theatre. Yeah. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Uh, good. But it all ended in Japan. Yeah. But uh, we had another American come in. I won't mention his name. I'm not going to mention names because he wasn't a good dialogue cutter. Mm. And Terence had a go at uh, one or two of the bumps that were coming on the track. He couldn't cut. He didn't cut as well as I did, mm. because it's a, it's a great. It's a, it's a long job. It takes a lot of patience mm. to cut it absolutely in sync. And, and he didn't come. The other the other guy didn't come out well out of it. But we got around it somehow. I can't remember how. Mm. But it was quite a good nice. Uh, it was a uh, it was a French crew. Mm. And um, what was his name? John, John somebody. He was quite a well-known French editor, yeah. and his assistant was French. But it, for me, it was a lonely picture because there was no social, no social mixing with with us at all. Yeah. So I was on my uh, on my own out there for five months. Oh, right. the film, yeah. I don't know what the, I don't know what sort of business the film did. Oh. But it, it was okay. It was a gangster film. It was a gangster movie. Mm. Back with it, yeah. yeah. And mm. uh, yeah, it was the end of that. Uh, but overall, I had five visits, to, six visits to Rome. Yeah. The first was a, a John Houston picture, which yeah. I did the foliage on, and it was called A Walk with Love and Death. Mm. Um, and what it was the other side? Oh, of course, the Cassandra Crossing. I've talked about the Cassandra Crossing before. Mm. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That was a good one. Mm. But I've met some some nice artists overall. I mean, I, I've worked with some big people. I've worked with most and lots of big people, mm. uh, including Ava Gardner and Sophie Loren, mm. uh, Richard Harris, oh, God, Roger Moore, Schwab Connery, yeah. Donald Sutherland. Oh, I could go on forever talking about it. I won't name any more because it's a bit I mean, boring. What was, what was Ava Gardner like to... to right? What was, that, what was Ava Gardner like? Oh, she was very sweet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very very nice. Yeah. And she, 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 at the time she had a drink problem. Yeah. And she said to me, oh, Vern, she said, please help me, I hate doing this. Yeah. And 
Yeah, she was very pleasant. Yeah. Yeah. There was one person I wanted to mention, um, James Mason. Did you? I've never worked with James. Worked, worked with James Mason. No, no, no. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, we were talking about t- t- Terence Sharon. Of course, he was very inter- in, in, uh, instrumental in the success of those early Bond pictures. Oh yes, um, oh he certainly did. But yeah. I think you'll find a lot of it was down to Peter Hunt and the editing. Oh, a tremendous yeah. amount, yeah. Now yeah. I worked with Peter Hunt for six weeks on a documentary. Uh, it's about the, the passion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I never really got to know him. But uh, he was a nice guy, I like Peter. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and John Glenn, I think, was Peter's assistant for some time. I think asked. John's connection. Or oh, incidentally, John Glenn's first picture of the Bond was for your eyes only. Yeah, yeah, your your first as as well. Yeah, yeah. And the uh, John told me that it was on a fortnight's notice. Oh right, oh, dear. He said if it didn't work out, it yeah. was out. Yeah, yeah. That's what uh, he told me that. Yeah. Uh, kind of it all worked out. Yeah. I worked. I got on very well with John. Uh, we were mates really. Okay. And, uh, and John, uh, John uh, he was a very good second unit director. Uh, it's obviously where, uh, where he started uh, on the Bonds was yeah. in the second unit. And, 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 and going back to, uh, to Bond and Willie Bogner, mm. I don't know if I mentioned it previously, but Willie Bogner did all the early skiing stuff in the Bond pictures. He did, yeah. 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 And he was very good. And he had a, uh, a big, I thought of not exactly an empire, but of ski clothing and ski oh, gear. Yeah, still, still yeah. available to Everything to do with skiing. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And he was a very generous man, you know. Mm. I told you, I think I told you he took us to the beer festival. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. he supplied all the um, crew. I, I was a bit late to get him one. Nice jackets yeah. with fire ice and dynamite. At the end of the production, he kept us all on for the premiere. And, and uh, invited all our wives to come over at, at the premiere. And so we had about two weeks to do nothing, you know, just to wander around Munich. Uh, and then we had the premiere. And Peter Davis and myself were on stage. We were not presenting to the, all the people at the premiere. Mm. But the trouble with uh, the stories that go around is that no, no distributor, distributor would touch it mm. because it was full of adverts. Because ah. the, the whole yeah. film was sponsored by manufacturers like Volkswagen ah. and yes. beer companies and so mm. So I don't think it ever got released generally. I don't know. Um, and I hated the music. I don't know who did it. I can't remember who did the music. Mm. But it was all pop songs. Mm. I, said, I said to William at the time, I said, I hate this music. I said, it, it, it dates it. Mm. At any rate, come Christmas, I got a CD from him. Mm. <laughs> he, um, Peter didn't. Peter Davis, he had, lives in Marlow, he didn't get a music disc. <laughs> but I think oh, did, Willie just did it to rub me up the wrong way a little bit. Probably. But, uh, no, I forget the reason it was terrible. And Roger Moore was in the film. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, his son and daughter were also in the film. Mm. Uh, Roger Moore wasn't in it much. He was just a, a law somebody that arranges this big race. Mm. Uh, some of the, some of the uh, different events were quite good, mm. but there's a, there's one real that just presents everybody. Mm. Like Volkswagen and beer people, just all running around this like a circus. Mm. It was boring, yeah. yeah. But some yeah. of the actual stuff was quite good. My last picture, um, I spent a few weeks at Pinewood, and then I took what I'd done to Orlando, where I spent the next eight weeks on a film called Christopher Cubs, The Discovery. Um, during that time, um, I received a copy from apparently Mar- Marlon Brando, who played played the part of the cardinal, mm-hmm. and on it he's written Vernon, 
was a miserable memory, except the crew. Many regards, Marlon. Wonderful. And uh, Marlon expresses what I felt about the film and yeah. what John felt about the film. Right. <laughs> uh, the small TV studio was attached to Universal Studios in Orlando. Yeah. And I worked and lived in Orlando for eight weeks. And nothing wrong with a crew, except the fact that they'd never done a feature film before. Right. Um, we recorded or did the final mix to a video. We had a Dolby man come down from New York and fitted a sheet. We worked on a sheet. Um, it was very amateurish in many ways. But the crew, I can't complain about the crew, they were, they worked so hard because after we'd finished at the end of the day, they would carry on dubbing TV films, or TV commercials and so mm. forth. So they were working very long hours. And during the final process of mixing the film, John said to me, what the fuck am I doing here? <laughs> Because the ADR effects were pretty non-existent yeah. and not in sync, mm. but there was a nice crew, quite a young crew, mm. never experienced the sort of editing of dialogue that I'd done. Mm. But I, but on the then time codes were coming in on on, on feature films, and I edited all the wild track shot for dialogue in England, hmm. because I don't think they had the equipment there to do it in the way I wanted to do it. Hmm. And they cut the master to what I'd done, hmm. because they were working dis digital. Hmm. And your experience for me, I never worked digital, I didn't want to know about, it, about digital. But um, the dialogue, nothing wrong with dialogues, but it was the effects, uh, and it was hard work, mm. and we would rock and roll, rock and roll, rock and roll, and the chief mixer, I can't remember his name, said, we are getting there, Brian, we are getting there, <laughs> <laughs> and it became quite a joke after that. Yeah. Eventually, we dubbed the film. Mm. Uh, I got a print of it, but it was, I think, embarrassingly bad. Mm. I mean, yeah. Darby played the other discoverer's part. Yeah, I don't know what. I can't remember the character he played. Mm. And he he's got a mad scene. I think he dies at sea. Yeah, but he's got a mad scene in, on the boat. Mm. It was that uh, as well. Not very good. No, no. Did you ever meet the the soul kinds, the producers, or I guess so. You you wouldn't have met the uh, the, the soul kinds who produced it at all. I, I guess they were just doing their well, own. Well, I only saw thing. them. They just popped in a couple of times. A couple of times, yeah. But yeah. John John left me to it a little bit, but yeah. he was with me, with me most days. Yeah. I wouldn't mix it without John because. Uh, I think probably the effects were okay, but the footsteps uh, or the ADR work was. Mm. We tried to replace some of them. It was better to leave them out than to feature them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Because once you, you get hear footsteps out, I think you think, oh, crikey. Yeah. Because in England, you know, in America, they're so precise. Yeah. But this was a young, I don't know how long they'd been in existence, mm. but they were used to dubbing. Like you, you couldn't really blame them because they were used to dubbing TV style. Yeah. They were used mm. to worry about footsteps. Yeah. So they probably didn't know what ADR was really, mm. just apart from dialogue. So, mm. But I remember one sequence there. Uh, the the boys doing dialogues used to have a lunch brought into me. They were great big beef burgers. Mm. I turned around them one day and I said, God, no wonder you're both overweight. 
<laughs> so, uh, we've got your easy. Mm. And we had a PR man, Tom. He said, well, I know what you like. Salmon and cucumber sandwiches. I said, you're right. So the following day, he brought me in cucumber and salmon sandwiches. They were this thick. <laughs> I said, Tom, you bought the right ingredients, but they're about three times the size that I, I normally eat. Mm. Oh, okay, bro. Right. <laughs> so, so he produced some sandwiches. But I was, uh, I went to Disneyland with John and Jenny and his wife one evening. It was quite an experience. The first time I seen Western dancing, mm. uh, genuine Western dancing. Yeah, quite impressed with it. And I stayed at the. Oh God, I've got a jacket with it, hasn't it? Can't remember. Anyway, they gave me a car, and then after about a week or two, <coughs> excuse me, I moved to into into a, a private apartment, mm. which was about five miles away. Yeah. You know. But overall, it was a very good location. I enjoyed it, and it was a, a nice conclusion to my career, really. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, and of course, even better time was when you were on Licence to Kill and there was a lot of speculation why the film moved to, to Mexico rather than, than Pinewood. And I believe you have a, a letter from uh, the Bond people saying why why it was shot in Mexico oh, and, yes, and not yes. Pinewood. Yes. Well, here I have a, a letter from the Bond people mm -hmm. before I commenced the film explaining why they were shooting in oh, Mexico. Mexico yeah. And it's basically, I think it was money. Mm -hmm. But in the end, I think going to Mexico was more expensive yeah. because yeah. there was so much corruption involved. Yeah. And I think in the end, the film ended up costing more going to mm. Mexico than they did at Pinewood. Yeah. But we ended up at Pinewood, and was, we had a nice time, mm. that's it. And, and, and we had a nice yeah. trip afterwards mm. to France. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> and of course the, the facilities you had to work with in Mexico probably weren't yes, as, yes. as good as Pinewood, of, of course. Did you photograph I, I have, yeah, that's, um, that's perfect. Um, here is my letter of, of termination, Yeah. which was what you got after every film. We've got, that's from 1950. Apart from Pinewood, they were issued three year contract. Mm. Most of us work freelance. Yeah. So it's a word of mouth for the next job. Mm -hmm. Or people you knew who had who, who worked for before. Yeah. And Pinewood, no bar now, but many people put up jobs going into Pinewood and going in, into the bar at Pinewood. Mm. And that, that's how I got the film De Zeppelin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just popped in and uh, John Shirley was there. He said, are you working? And I said, no. And he said, come and do my dialogues. Mm -hmm. So I ended up going on Zeppelin for about three months. And, and that's John Shay, the, the editor? Yes. But what was John Shay like? Cause he, of course he's oh, John, he was a nice guy. He liked to be in the theatre when you did ADR. Mm -hmm. I mean, many, many films I've done I've been left alone with the artist, uh, and um, but John liked to sort of take over. If the director wasn't there, John used to like to take over. Mm. But Les Wiggins, who's deceased, yeah, uh, was the effect editor. Mm. Yeah, and, and he worked with John before. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think it's only a short film, really. Yeah, about three months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and did we mention Derek Holding, who worked on Living Daylights, and he died? Yeah, Derek uh, Holding, I met Derek Holding at Burton Park Studios in, back in 52, 53. Mm. Um, and he and Colin became a team on quite a few films. Yeah. He was good at dialogues. I did one film, oh, I did two films in, in, uh, in Madrid. Mm. Um, but the, big, the biggest of the two was a film called Hundra. Right. It was about the 
Pandra was the leader of a female tribe. Mm. And she goes out hunting one day, she has a big white horse. And while she's away, the barbarians creep into the village and kill all the women. It's not a very good script, really. <laughs> um, and she comes back, find them all dead. So she sets off to get impregnated, impregnated by one of these barbarians because they had a big six foot bloops. Um, and the story is during a, the ADR. I was, she was very easy to work with, and a lovely personality, and she was the fiance of the director. Mm. And she couldn't scream. And she, there's a big fight in a hut with her and one of the barbarians. She wants to get impregnated, but the barbarian is, is very rough in his, his handling. Mm. And it starts a fight between them. And she's quite a strong one woman. Mm. So they have this fight throwing each other around in this hut. But she couldn't gasp and couldn't scream. So I said, uh, get up on my shoulders. I'll make you scream. And I waved her around with the, with the uh, I had a first, I've never done this before with anybody. Yeah. Uh, but she was quite gay. And we had a first assistant director working with me. And he held her, but she still couldn't scream. Mm. So she came down off my shoulders. So it's a joke when I think about it. <laughs> and she said, well, punch me hard in the stomach. I said, I can't do that. So i tell you what I'll do. I'll put my arms around you, and every time this guy hits you, you do a gasp. Yeah. And it will come naturally. And then, yeah, that's what we did. But if we had to get a, a good screamy out of it, yeah. we, had to get a, we had to get one of the extras to do the screams. Yeah. Mm. But... In the afternoon, that was a morning session. In the afternoon, the warrior came in and he couldn't yell and gasp. So I did the same to him. Oh, the bloody hard work. Uh, but we got that, we got a good performance out of him. You know, we did all the right things. But uh, working with the two guys that could hardly speak English was not good. But uh, I think this director's name was Matt Baker. And he came in on one session. He wasn't really interested. Yeah. And he started picking the pieces. Hmm. I said, Matt, just keep quiet because unless you're involved with the whole session, you don't know what's going for and you know what's coming afterwards. So keep quiet. Hmm. And then no word for it. But during the pre preparation for the ADR, he went off to America and unknown to me, somehow took a, a copy of the film or a section of the film and he put American voices on the Spanish people in America. Hmm. I'd already done them in, 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 the, in English, yeah. in the theatre. Yeah. So that annoyed me and, that, and I didn't know about it. But gradually I... I fell out with him because uh, I, I won't believe his name as a producer. He came in the cutting room with Matt. He said, Vern, do we normally have to do all this ADR on a film? I said, yes, because the sound recordist was hired by him, mm. the director. Yeah. And I said, and she's not very good. Mm. You know, it's quite special to do the mm. film and follow them around with a bike and so on. And, um, but one thing led to another and I completely fell out with it. During my time coming back on leave from, um, from Nigeria, mm. I got a week's leave for every month I spent in Nigeria. The first tour lasted 19, 19 months. I died at 21 months. That means I had 21 months leave. Oh. So I got a couple of fillings during that time. And the first filling was a TV series called 
court martial mm. during dialogues. Jimmy Groom was the sound editor, but I did dialogues. And I think Judy Dench was in it. Mm -hmm. And she could only be about 20. And I think it was a, a first experience of ADR. Yeah. I got the impression she had never done it before. Mm. But she was easy to work with. Well, I think the uh, interview had gone on long enough. Yeah. And just to wind up, I'd like to add that uh, on, on reflection, I had a fantastic career. Mm. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Work was never a hardship. I've travelled the world at somebody else's expense. Mm -hmm. Spent some times in Rome, Poland, Madrid, America, Nigeria, Sierra Leone. Mm. And it's been a, a thorough experience. Mm. And on the road I've met some lovely people, good technicians, top technicians, knew what they were doing. And I can really say that, that I've been honoured to be in the film industry. Mm. I thoroughly enjoyed it and recommended it. Mm. And I think I started as a projectionist yeah. you know, in working part-time in 1943. Mm. But for the luck of the good Lord, yeah. I met at the Pathy Newsroom a union man who asked me to join the union. Mm. Um, what a difference that made to my life. Yeah. I don't know what I would have done otherwise. Yeah. So I'm thankful that I had a good career, a lovely wife, or had a lovely wife, mm -hmm. and a good family. Yeah. And I thank God. Yeah. And thank you for, for being so patient. Well, well, thank you, Vernon, for um, sharing those wonderful memories of of, as you said, a, a blessed career and a blessed life. Um, oh, I can tell you about Gene Simmons. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. Before, yes, yes. before we go, about then, if you want to tell about Gene yeah. Simmons, that'd be lovely. Is it running still? It's still running, yep. Uh, during my junior years, very junior years, I went to Clear House Council School. Hmm. Uh, it was on the edge of the council estate. And Gene Simmons used to attend the same school. Mm. He was the best looking girl in the school, I have to admit. And during the, say, period of about 1911, I, I used to sit next to him in class. Mm. Uh, and we became quite friends. And I used to go around to her house. I went to her 11th birthday party. And uh, met her mother, well I met her mother before because I'd been around on, on Saturday morning. Well let me just interject that, that I lived on the council estate mm. and she lived on the, on the Golders Green estate. Yeah. Not far away from me, Bella Mar. And I used to go around to her house and I, found a, I remember one Saturday morning I was around there and she had a, they had a little dog. I learned fierce and I was wearing Wellingtons. Mm. And this the bit of very behold of my Wellington. Oh, I remember that. But mm. well, eventually I said I went to her 11th birthday party and we had lots of cream and an, an orange and I was sick as a dog. <laughs> <laughs> I made a, made a fool of myself. But it, um, as we left school to go to grammar school at 11 years old, we both went to the same grammar school, uh, but the boys and girls had separate schools. And, and I didn't know, I suppose I lost track with her really. Mm. But she eventually left, I don't know what age she left Orange Hill, but the next thing I knew, she was uh, at some academy, the Dramatic Arts Academy, and later I learned that she had been hired by rank. Mm. She became a rank starlet. Yeah. Not number one, but she was in a couple of early films, which I can't remember the titles on. And um, my first, my recollection from then on is that um, I met her at Pinewood. 
and again I walked on the set during lunch time uh, and we met and had a few words and that was that. But I was working at Twickenham Studios in 1970 mm. and she was working on a small film, I think it was called Dominique, that was ever released, mm. I'd never heard of it. And um, I thought I must go and see her. So toward the end of lunch break I walked on the stage and there she was playing the piano. And as I walked on, she didn't look up, she carried on playing. And then she looked round, she heard my footsteps. And uh, she looked, Van, she said, come and sit down. Mm. And we chatted for about ten, ten minutes. And she said, we must go out for a meal together. Mm. I said, you know what, I'm working in the studio, you better go give, give this number a ring, mm. you know, extension number. And I'm there. But she rang the following day apologising that she couldn't, she was unable to, to meet the date. Mm. And I was thinking, you know, and that was the last I had. Mm. And I think she died about three or four years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah unfortunately. Um, I, I just wanted to, to finish off with just a, 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 a final thought on Licence to Kill in the respect that we, we know it wasn't very well received, had a lot of competition at the time. Would you have liked to have done another one had they been successful? Because there was lots of changes that happened in the, the structure. Yes. Um, well, you should ask me. Hmm. Did you expect to carry on after? Y y yeah, you were, yes. Did you expect to carry on after Licence to Kill? Because you, you had obviously got three bonds under your belt. What did you feel? Yeah. Or there's more to give? Well, have, somehow after working on the three, we'd, we'd become a family. Yeah. We knew each other's thoughts, we knew each other how we worked, we all worked hard and we all enjoyed a beer. Hmm. Not drunkenness, but just a beer together, yeah. social. Because hmm. I'm not a dreamer as such. And it came as a bit of a surprise when the bosses completely changed the crew. John Glenn. Hmm. They wanted a fresh, a fresh crew, which yeah. I could understand. Hmm. Uh, Although it would have been nice to have carried on, hmm. uh, it would have been a nice to have to finish on. Yeah, yeah. It, it, there was also, of course, some legal issues which meant they couldn't make a film that quickly after. So No, it, well there's yeah. usually, after uh, a Bond film, there's usually at least a year's break. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot of preparation, a lot of locations to find. Yeah. And, yeah, one always knew who the cast was going to be, yeah. well, the main cast. Uh, but um, it was, um, no, I mean, uh, we, one. It's good to change. Oh yeah, yeah. and it had been six years between License Kill and, and yeah. Old Nice, so maybe there was just a feeling of, of needing yeah. new new blood, for lack of a better word, really. Yeah, John and I did a, a film after that called the the What's a Favour and the Very Very Fish. Mm. Did I mention that last time? I mean, well, if you want to mention it briefly, that that'd be lovely, Bernard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with Bob Hoskins and um, who was the wife of um, the one who got killed in a ski a ski accident? One, uh, one of the uh, Richardson Red Graves. Uh, uh, Julie, um, oh, Liam Neeson's wife wasn't. Uh, yes, that's it. Yes. Um, Natasha was it? Natasha yeah, Natasha Richardson. Richardson. Yes, sir, yeah. It was a quite little film, but. My first view of it, I went over to Paris to view it and I had to view it on a, a steam bank editing machine. Mm -hmm. Not the best, not the best to view it on. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I can't remember his director's name. He was an Australian director. Mm -hmm. He said to me, what do you think of it, Bern? I said, well, it's different. <laughs> because I didn't... John, John said it was quite funny, but I think I did, at the time I didn't uh, quite appreciate it. But thinking about it now, it was quite a, a funny little film. Hmm. Not a comedy, but had, had highlights. Yeah. And Bob Costas was, was, was very good in it. Hmm. He played the part of a, a Voitart over. Uh, he used to dub foreign film, make all the 
Granted, Rise of Sex he is oh, yeah, and yeah. Natasha Richardson yeah. was the female. She used the female parts. Mm. But I can remember Lewin, his name was Lewin, but I can't remember his name. Well, oh, Ben Lewin. Mm. Ben Lewin is his name. Well, ben was very indecisive. So I, we did an ADR session at the Mayflower Theatre up in um, Park Lane. Mm. I think it's part of it, yeah. And I had allowed two days and we ended up doing it three and a half hours. Well, That's in the end how I did it as if he was. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we went round on one section and I, well it got to the point where I say, how's it for you, Ben? He say, um, um I said, let's go again. <laughs> I make up with own mind. Yeah. So after about ten rounds, old Bob said to him, "Make up your bloody mind." He said, "Stick a broom up my ass, and I'll sweep the bloody floor for you." But make up your bloody mind. <laughs> and I somewhere I've got a picture of Hoskins. Hmm. And bed in the theatre, but I can't remember what it is. But uh, even with Natasha, we had a wild, the last line in the picture is a, a, one of those mix up pictures. Yeah. You know, he doesn't know that she has to go to this and she doesn't know the book of this. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's a wild line, and she must have said it a hundred times, and she said, Ben. I've said it a hundred times. I don't know how else to say it again. <laughs> and um, John came into our room. We were near to Dublin and I was working long hours to get it finished. And he said, oh, Ben wants to listen to all your sound effects. I said, well, you go and tell Ben to go and fuck himself. <laughs> I said, because we have not got that time for that sort of luxury. I said, I'm working like hours now. Mm. But uh, he never said it. Yeah. Mm. But it was, it was looking back on it, and I had a, a, a video copy of it. Yeah. I've never seen it. You can't, at one time it was, it was 28 pounds yeah. on a DVD. Yeah. Uh, but I think, I don't think it's on, on I don't think you can buy it now. What's it called, Vernon? The Watch, The Favour, The Very Big Fish. I'll see I, I can find it for you. The Very Big Fish. It's a funny title. Okay. It's, it's, the start of it is a bit stupid, but it's yeah. amusing. Mm. He's got a, a naggy wife, you know. Yeah. But it, I suppose it's a love story in a way. Mm. Well, that's yeah, really they, interesting. Doing their voices and that. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, but Bob Hoskins was easy to work with. Mm. I love old Bob. Yeah. It was an asset to the business. Um, I suppose that the Bond fans watching would love to know, do you have a favourite Bond film? What's your favourite, uh, either as an audience member or as, or, what would be your favourite favourite Bond film? Do you have one or do you like them all? Oh, I like Licence to Cool. Is it your favourite one that you... Yeah, I think, I think yeah. the action was good in that. Yes. Okay. Especially the, the Tanker Chase. Yeah. Oh, I'll tell you one little thing. We had a, a third W editor. What was his name? A little um, thing in his his room. Mm. What do they call it? Yeah. Oh, a keyboard. Keyboard, yeah. yeah. And when the ricochets hit one of the tankers, yeah. He put the uh, da 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 da. da. Oh. <laughs> and then if you listen, right? Well, if you know it's there, you can. I but I think I don't think many people realise what it was. I'll, well, he, that's what he did on it, yeah. I'll, I'll watch out for that. Yeah, I'll put it on yeah. tonight. That's, uh, yeah. that's uh, very good. Um, but Mark, his name was Mark. Yeah. Didn't know. But it was recommended by John Glenn's son. Um, and I already had somebody in mind, yeah. Peter Musgrave, because Peter Musgrave was bloody good. Yeah. It was very, a bit slow, but he was very good. Yeah. And the final question, um, Vernon, is do, do you have a favourite film of in your career that you, you worked on, if you said, this is the film I want to be remembered for working on, is there one? 
Well, I, th I think one of the films I enjoyed on most of all, although it's not the best film, was the space film. Yeah, Life, life Force. Yeah. 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 Because that was much more demanding. Hmm. And I wanted a challenge. Yeah. 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 It's a really great film. I, I've only seen, you know, what I've seen with you, but on the big screen with that, with that sound system. Yeah. It's, it, yeah. It's a really. I mean, fun it, it, it's, it, in places it's a bit long. Yeah. But on that film, I was threatened with to bring on an American editor. Right. To sound editor. Yeah. Or sound designer. And I said to Tom Grover, I said, if you bring an American, I'm leaving. Mm -hmm. I said, this is my film, if I don't get it. So, yeah. But it was only Toby Hoover. Yeah. So in the, after, after that time, uh, they wanted me to rough up three sequences. Yeah. Well, they turned out very successful. Mm. And Toby was very pleased. Mm. He said to me, you're as good as any American that is, sound is. I said, thank you, Toby. Uh, a bit of a compliment, considering mm. he, want, yeah. he wanted uh, American over. Yeah. And we asked the Americans to supply some track that we had, who we had in mind. Mm. And quite frankly, it was a, two bowls of seven inch spools mm. of sound effects. I think I used about four or five of them. Mm. And that was mainly for the uh, noise of the back when he came out of the end. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was a mixture yeah. of everything. Yeah. But on that film, I think I told you in the previous, I did all the sound effects for the people on the bed where they wake up. Oh yes, all the... All the groaning. Yes, yes. Yeah. That was me. It's very, very haunting, it's very um, eerie, yeah. that, but it's very well done. Yeah. And I did that in my bedroom. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, It's a challenge, isn't it, really? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Anyway, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Bernard.